Sean, can you tell us about the day that you told your parents that you were moving to Los Angeles and what were the emotions that were going through you at that time? Um, so yeah, that's interesting because uh, I had been talking about moving to Southern California for a while and I had a very close friend of mine who we had similar dreams, similar aspirations and actually in a lot of ways, uh, it was him pushing me to follow my dreams and chase my dreams. Uh, his name is Josh Taylor. Huh. Um, and uh, he was a incredibly gifted actor, comedian, also musician, singer, the whole nine. He was just one of those people that anything he put his energy into, uh, he excelled. And we had a English class together in uh, junior high, I think is where it first started. And that teacher, Mr. Young was his name, was amazing. He would give Josh like 10 minutes at the end of class to basically do a stand-up routine. And he really recognized that energy and Josh pulled me into being a part of it. And so that's kind of how I started um, really kind of thinking about it past, you know, I, I grew up in the theater with my father being a drama professor, all that. So I was in the theater world, I was very comfortable. But this kind of going up just almost stand-up in a way um, improv uh, was was a little bit newer to me at the time, but he kind of really pushed me. And so over the years, our kind of dream of moving to Southern California, Los Angeles, pursuing the dream of being actors really at that time. Um, and uh, what ended up happening is he decided he couldn't go. And so I was kind of left last minute, um, you know, going, do I go or do I, you know, by myself and uh, my parents have always been super supportive and they knew for years and years uh, I don't remember the exact moment I told them I was going to move down there but it was just kind of common knowledge uh, in my hometown I was directing commercials and acting in them uh, since from like 16 years to like 20 years old I, I'd probably done like 30 commercials and so uh, the kind of creative endeavors were always supported by both my my mom and dad. They they thought it was amazing. They loved it, and they said, you know, you should you should pursue this. So, uh, just always support from them. There was never like any pushback or anything like that. And so it was just a matter of when I was going to go, you know. And I also did some live performance stuff, uh, and uh, I made it onto the news several times just for those kinds of things. Nice. And again. Even in those conversations, it was, so what are you going to do? Where do you see yourself in the next couple of years? It was, I'm going to be down in Los Angeles pursuing my dream of making movies. You know, it was always that kind of thing. So um, the exact moment, I don't recall, but all those conversations with my parents were always, um, you've got to pursue it. It's just in you. There's something that you have to express, and uh, and we support that. And so when my a uh, good friend decided at that time he that wasn't the path for him. Uh, obviously, I was a little scared, and kind of everything that I had planned was was you know now in the open. And both my parents were like, "You got this, you know. You 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 uh, have made this plan. You should follow through with it. You should do it." And um, and so I did. And it was a very emotional day the day I left. That was really emotional. We you know uh, helped me pack up a truck and. And uh, with the trailer and kind of everything I owned packed up in there and and uh, ventured out uh, on, on my own, which just a week earlier I thought was going to be, you know, with me and my best friend. And um, but yeah, I, I, I did it. No regrets. And and uh, uh, I think I've always been adventurous in that way, like big, big life decisions. Uh, met married my wife within one month um, and we've done uh, some. Uh, you know, buying from buying houses to to just uprooting and moving. We've done these things. She's very much spontaneous that way as well. And so we've we've kind of done a lot of big life decisions. We'll we'll spontaneously make a choice and just go with it. And I think what we understand is that we're going to have an adventure no matter what. And that uh, you know, and I, that's kind of my mindset as as well. I'm like, let's just go for it. You know, let's see what happens. And uh, and. Uh, uh, and luckily, my parents were very supportive in that way. That's awesome. Do, do you still keep in touch with Josh? 
So we reconnected years later, um, and yes, yeah, so we still keep in touch. Full circle, kind of coming back. He he uh, lives in Portland now, mm -hmm. and married, has a wonderful family, kid, uh, and uh, he still plays music and uh, um, and has a band and all of that. So I was doing my second feature, and uh, when we kind of reconnected through social media, you know, it was one of those things, and uh, and I said, I've got this sequence in this movie it's an action movie and it is this guy trying to go the straight and narrow so he's trying to uh you know do the right thing in life and not be part of this criminal underworld and his friends in the criminal underworld they're trying to do this kind of heist thing without him and so the in the movie it's cross cut between him trying to get a regular job and them going and trying to shoot up this speakeasy and both scenes are playing out, you know, they're cross-cutting with each other. And I just had this vision of Josh singing this song, just him and an acoustic guitar, this kind of slow, melodic thing that I knew he could do really well from way back when we were kids. And uh, so when we reconnected, I went, ah, oh, I've got this, I'm doing this movie, and, and would you be willing to do an original song for it? And so that kind of you know full circle friendship came back, and uh, and he did. It's, the song is awesome. The very first version he sent me, it was it. He was like, "Tell me if you want changes. You want no." And I, of course, I told him the story. I told him what was going on, and he wrote the lyrics that that kind of matched with it. And but the very first version he sent me, I just it was it. And I was like, "Nope, I don't need anything else. This is what's going to go in the movie." And and it did. And uh, and. Uh, and everybody loved that scene. That was like the scene people talked about in the movie. So that was a really cool thing to be able to reconnect with him. And, and I hope to do some more in the future to get him to do some music uh, for them would be amazing. Very cool. Did you almost not drive down since, since you're sort of partner in crime, your, your, your friend that you sounds like you looked up to him too a lot, um, decided that he didn't want to go? I think that there was definitely that moment. I think there was definitely that uh, moment of... of you know, self-doubt or could I do this on my own, especially because it kind of had been this joint dream of ours, you know. Um, but again, I think I had support from my family and all of that. That that, uh, But sure, I definitely had that moment and felt that way. But uh, ultimately, uh, I think through the experiences in my life, the family support, also martial arts training. I, I trained martial arts from very, very young. I think that probably gave me the confidence to overcome any of those doubts. Um, and, uh, um, but yeah, definitely had it. Definitely was there. Definitely sure. was, you know, questioning that, uh, whether or not to do it. So you're driving down the five, of course, obeying the speed limit, yeah. I'm sure, right? <laughs> you know, with that big old trailer, I was probably going slower than the, the speed limit. Okay. And the grapevine was scary. Ooh, I'm not even yes. going to lie. The it's grapevine terrifying. coming over that hill in that, it was a, it was a, old Chevy S10, it was four cylinder, it was gutless. And then having this big old trailer pulling behind was, uh, that was uh, very interesting. Right, and then you see the part where it's like, if your brakes fail, you can go up this thing. And you're <laughs> yes, like, why are they telling right. me that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sean, if someone were to tell you that filmmaking is a pipe dream, what would you tell them? I've always been a believer in, in and again, my parents have probably, uh, get all the credit for this, but you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. So there's many things that can be a pipe dream uh, if you let them be a pipe dream. But if it's really in your core and your soul and your energy to pursue being a filmmaker, uh, I think you have to pursue it. Um, and that's really up to you if, if you are uh, someone who has to express yourself that way. Um, and uh, I, I also come from that mindset, and maybe it's the martial arts, uh, but also family is that never give up, never surrender type of uh, attitude. So for me, uh, I have pursued this business in, a, I think, an interesting way. I, I've done just about every job you can do in filmmaking. Uh, from hair and makeup to, you know, to stunt coordination. To, to I, I've always been, and I had a mentor early on in this business who told me to diversify or die, and I've really kind of 
took that to heart. And as long as I was working on a film or television show, I viewed it as number one educational uh, to to the ultimate goal, which is you know directing for myself. Um, I viewed it as an education, and I was getting to be a part of something that I love, which is telling stories. Uh, so, um, I think pipe dreams are uh, only limited by your own drive. Um, and so, again, if you don't give up, I believe you can make it. So, uh, a lot of the people that I have uh, been lucky enough to collaborate with over the years, uh, the stories are almost the same. It's they didn't give up. And all these overnight successes you, you read or hear about, they're usually 10 years, 20 years in the making. Uh, and so it's those people that with that drive that uh, end up having success on a, on a multitude of different levels. How many people were in the town where you grew up? Uh, roughly like 30 to 50,000 people uh, is, is kind of the population. When I, was, when I was growing up, it's probably more now. Uh, but it was also a college town. So when college students were in it, it was like double. And did they have a film program there? Or um, not at the time? I don't know if they have a film. There is a lot of theater. So like uh, my father was a drama professor. He directed two plays a year. He produced Shakespeare in the Park. So there was a lot of arts that way. Um, as far as film goes, I think you can study some film at both Chico State and, uh, and uh, Butte College, but I don't know if it's a full-blown film program. At least it wasn't when I grew up there. Maybe they do have something like that now. So did you ever drive down or, or fly down from Chico to the LA area and see what it was like here? I did. So I still have family who uh, were down in Southern California, both San Diego, some in, in Los Angeles. So um, I did spend time, and also my grandparents when I was younger, they still lived in Chatsworth. So I spent time there for that. And then uh, also I would come down for summers and visit family. Um, I, I visited my family down in San Diego from probably like 14 through like 20. I would come down every summer and stay with my aunt and uncle. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I was very familiar with Southern California. It wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't a culture shock when I moved down here in that way. Um, I, there was other things that, you know, sure, I, I wasn't expecting, but uh, um, I at what? least had some inkling, inkling, you know. Well, I think uh, um, moving to uh, LA itself, I think I didn't fully grasp what traffic meant. You know, even living in San Diego, there's traffic. But when you live, live in Los Angeles, like really fully understanding, oh, that it's five miles away, but that still means an hour in traffic. You know, like that, <laughs> I think those kinds of things I couldn't prepare for. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I certainly think, what I actually thought was interesting is, Sometimes Los Angeles might get a bad rap, like, oh, everybody's so rude or this or that. I think I kind of had an opposite experience. I'm like, man, people are actually really nice. And, you know, people say hello to me all the time. And, you know, like, so almost I became a defender of, of Los Angeles in that way. I'm sure that there's rude people everywhere, and especially in traffic. That's when you get the rude people, I think. But, uh, you know, walking around the streets of, of you know, everywhere, I mean, Hollywood to, to, to Burbank, to uh, you know the Valley, um, I've met such wonderful people and, and created such great friendships, and so I think there's a lot of uh, uh, misnomer. I think same thing with New York. You hear that you know that New York people might have a chip on their shoulder or something, and, but again, if you go there and experience it and live there, I think you you'll find a lot of great people too. Sure. It seems like too that you can you kind of have a way of fitting into any environment you go in. I get that sense that you you adapt. I guess that's probably true. Yeah, yeah. I think uh -huh. I'm very adaptable, and I try and uh, find common ground with people. And I believe that's probably a a great tool to have if you're going to be a collaborator. So myself as a a director or somebody who's captain, you know, being the captain of that ship, I try and lead through. Uh, that idea of collaboration like we're all working together for the same goal i'm definitely not a it's my way or the highway guy i i do have a strong vision and i do know what i want but i'm open to you know all the different ideas that can make 
that vision even better than maybe what I was expecting. So, um, uh, you know, so I'm very open-minded that way. And I think that that open-mindedness is what allows me to be adaptable and, and fit in and work in different situations. And um, I've just found it very useful. I think obviously uh, given my parents and family credit, but also the martial arts angle of it, I think uh, the philosophy of martial arts is, is very much that way. Um, studying something called Tai Chi, uh, it is all about accepting energy and redirecting it versus, you know, trying to like, you know, go head on, you know, blunt force, uh, you know, trauma with something. It's more about accepting that energy, redirect. If it's something negative, you can let it just go right by you. Um, if it's something useful, you can accept it and maybe redirect it in, in the way that you're um, you know, uh, approaching a problem solving uh, situation or, um, you know, being creative. Knowing that you had this quote unquote filmmaking dream and you, you figured you were definitely coming to LA and this was going to be your path. What were the three obstacles, the biggest obstacles that held you back from maybe initially achieving it or from, um, yeah. Okay. I think, <clears throat> I think some of the biggest obstacles were maybe just kind of coming from that maybe smaller town mentality. Like it, growing up, becoming a filmmaker didn't even actually seem like a plausible dream. You know, uh, it, it just wasn't even something that I really thought about. It's like, oh no, you got to go to college. You got to get your, you know, got to get your uh, associate's degree. You know, like it just seemed like a different path. So as I started. You know, when I made that leap and moved down to Southern California, I didn't go right to LA. And so maybe there was part of that just not, you know, fully believing uh, it is really possible. I think part of me was like, yes, it's possible. And then other parts of me were like, oh, that's just a, you know, how would you even do that? How would you even accomplish that? So I think that that kind of uh, maybe self doubt is definitely probably one of the bigger obstacles. Um, I think just logistics like like figuring out what am i going to do when i get there like how how are you gonna um you know just pay rent um so that's probably some of it um and then again education i think taking those i took a uh, some uh film history classes in in college um and that really opened my eyes and then also having a teacher I took a creative writing class and then discovered he also taught a script writing class. And so I ended up taking that as well. So I think some of that education also helped um, uh, me decide that yes, I could you know, pursue this in, in, at some level. Um, and sorry, didn't, sorry to interrupt, but you no. actually took the same class three times? So the, the, <laughs> the history of film class that was, was taught at San Marcos College uh, down in, um, San Diego area was a great class. So I took the first class and it was Alfred Hitchcock. And so we went through the, um, his film history, like from the very first film he did all the way to the last film. And uh, we didn't watch every film, but we, you know, from the different eras, we, he would pick a film and we'd watch it. And so we broke it down, we studied the techniques, we, the different things that they, you know, the filmmaker would like to do and uh, how they interacted with actors, like the full thing, it was fascinating and I loved it. And uh, at the uh, end of the semester, I asked him, you know, do you do the same filmmaker every time? He goes, no, every semester is different. I go, well, who are you doing next? He's, um, well, I'm gonna do uh, Stanley Kubrick. I'm like, oh my God, I gotta take this class again. So I did, I ended up taking it three times uh, during my time there and studied three different filmmakers. And uh, I didn't get credit at all on the, uh, basically just auditing the class. Um, but I just really wanted to learn about those filmmakers. And so I think that was a really great education. Um, and then it was a different teacher for the creative writing and script writing. But I think after getting that education, uh, probably helped boost my confidence. Uh, and then I met and married my wife and she was like, why are we in San Diego? And I had done a short film and she loved it. Uh, she was, uh, you know, uh, rooting in my corner. She's like, this is amazing. You've got to go. And we put it in some film festivals and did good with it. But, um, but it was really her saying, you can do all this from San Diego, but you know, why not go and try, you know, try it up there. And so we did, we moved up there on a whim 
and uh, the rest is history. I ended up, I was doing personal training when I first moved uh, to LA to, to pay the bills. Um, but I got a job really quickly in, uh, in um, uh, production, being a PA and doing all that stuff. No job was ever too small for me. I was never afraid of hard work. I did ex extra work as well. And I would, I would bring a, a, a notebook and pen and I would take notes and I would study and try and learn. Like I viewed it as an opportunity to get on set and see what it's all about. Learn the terms. What do they all mean? What's that person's got to be in a mark? Okay, what you know? What's minimal focus distance mean? I, I literally would would try and learn every aspect of what was going on. Um, and again, I felt I treated it like I was getting paid to get an education. So, <clears throat> so I had no problem. I did I did extra work for probably nine months. Ended up getting my SAG card through that. Um, uh, and at the same time, I was personal training, and then I got the PA job on a TV show. And uh, I self, through my own little short films and things like that, in commercials, I had taught myself how to edit uh, on on you know on a Mac, uh, one of the early like uh, iMovie and Final Cut was first coming out, and the whole Adobe suites were just starting out when I was was doing that. And so I taught myself all the all the different little tools from Photoshop to After Effects, um, uh, you know, to editing. And uh, so I had some of those skills for my own short films. And that PA job I did on a television show, of course, I put on my resume, I can do Final Cut, I can do After Effects, I can do that. <clears throat> and it wasn't even a week into that production when they said, hey, we saw you do After Effects on uh, on your resume. And like we were under, you know, some crazy deadlines. Do you think you could help with some rotoscoping? I'm like, oh yeah, I've done that before, you know. So they gave me a couple shots and I did them, I turned them in. They're like, oh, this looks really good. Do you think you could do some more? I go, sure, sure, yeah, I'll, no problem. So I think that attitude of always just being there, ready to help, ready to work, helped me excel uh, through through this business like like wildfire. So one week into being a coffee runner on this TV show, the very next, so I stayed and they go, well, do you think you can work on a Saturday and help us? No problem, I'll be there. Showed up, helped, did, did many different things for visual effects, not just rotoscoping. I ended up compositing some pieces. I ended up um, doing some like uh, lighting effects and different things in there. Uh, by that Monday, I was, uh, a VFX uh, artist on the show. Then one week later, I became the lead green screen uh, effects artist on the show. So just within two weeks, just because I was ready to go, I was willing to put in the work and um, just having that positive attitude and also uh, um, like what we first started talking about this, being able to kind of uh, blend in or, or fit into any situation. Um, having that flexibility is, I think, what helped me excel. And that happened on other shows as well. Um, I was a assistant stunt coordinator on a show, and literally the third day of filming, I ended up becoming the second unit director on that show. Oh, wow. And it literally had to do with, I think perception is also, being perceptive is also a handy tool. Um, I was helping the, the stunt coordinator, helped with casting all the stunt uh, uh, people for this show, and it was an action-oriented show. So we had to choreograph and rehearse and do all these things. And I saw the executive producer pacing on like day two, back and forth, frustrated, and uh, just being, you know, just trying to be a nice guy, just, said, hey, are you okay? You know, and he starts telling me <laughs> about how they're, they're not making their days and, oh. and they don't know what to do. And uh, the director's moving too slow. And and I just threw out there just going, hey, well, you know, the stunt coordinator and myself, we're both directors. And I had actually already directed a feature at that point. And uh, I said, if you gave us a camera, we could, you know, more than uh, likely help you guys film stuff and, and hopefully make your day. I said, whatever scenes you want to give us, whatever pieces you want to give us, I know we could handle it. And the very next day, he showed up with, with a little like skeleton camera crew and said, Sean, all right, you're going to second unit direct this stuff. Which at that point, I got actually a little bit terrified because I was now going over my boss's head, the stunt coordinator. 
because like the second unit director is almost the next step up. And so I immediately went to him like, oh my gosh, I told him that you and I are both directors because we have both directed, that us as a team could help. I didn't say that I should be the director, <laughs> oh, no. you know, and, and luckily he's a great friend of mine. I've probably done the most work with him than anybody else in mm -hmm. this business. Uh, Noel Vega is his name. A wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, friend and uh, collaborator in this business for me. We, we've probably done over 100 projects together because we've worked on video games together. We've worked on stunt stuff. We, he's been a producer and I've been a director on projects. Uh, tele, entire television series we've done together. So we've really done a lot of stuff over the years. And he just he's also one of my mentors and kind of like that big brother uh, in this industry uh, for myself. But so I was mortified in that situation going, I, I by no means was trying to go over your head or try and pass you up. And uh, luckily he was like, I'm so busy as the stunt coordinator. He's like, you go do this, you go do it. And he championed me for that. And, and uh, it worked out well because whatever I shot was good enough for them, I guess. And so then I became the second unit director for the whole series and then ended up fully directing several episodes as the season went on and into season two. But that's an important lesson, it sounds like, because you learned to like go to him so it didn't seem like you were trying to go behind his back. Yes. That's a very stereotypical thing that happens in this industry and people do it all the time. And yeah, maybe they you try built and step on other people, yeah. 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 I found out, uh, well, at least it's been my experience that loyalty, um, in a positive way, obviously there could, you know, loyalty could, in certain situations maybe not be a great thing, but sure. uh, most situations is a good thing. But but for myself, my personal experience, loyalty has been a very um, positive uh, tool. Um, and I've only grown from those loyalties and those friendships and those, you know, I've never, and I'm just not that person as well. I don't wanna ever, you know, betray or step on somebody to get to, get to that next level. I'm much more the person, let's all build ourselves up together. We're stronger as a team. And, you know, I love the whole brat pack and the rat packs and that whole idea. Like, let's make our own film family and, and grow and, uh, and, and uh, uh, do it that way. Uh, versus I'm going to climb to the top and step on whoever I can to get there, you know. I think in some ways it's a slower process, right? Uh, not just stepping on people and getting to the top as fast as you can. Um, but obviously I think it's a more fulfilling way to do it. And I have stayed positive and happy in this business. I've been in it now 20 years um, versus feeling, you know, jaded or <laughs> uh, hate myself for the things that I've done, you know what I mean, uh, type of thing. Can I ask you, what was your first job growing up, like an after school job? Oh my gosh. Um, I don't know why it's coming to my, it's like I'm well, seeing like you doing something and I can't totally see what it is, but it sounds I was, like you're busy. I, yeah, you know, I'm one of those people who likes doing a lot of things at once. Like if you give me one task, it's probably way harder for me than if you give me three <laughs> tasks, right? So I think uh, uh, my first job, technically my very first job was teaching martial arts. Oh, really? So that's what it was and uh, kind of. I would, I would teach a class here and there. As a teenager? As a teenager. And then I went and got a job at Taco Bell. Uh -huh. And I worked at Taco Bell because I really wanted to save up for the Honda Civic hatchback. Nice. You know, okay. I was like 15 and a half and I started working at Taco Bell. And my martial arts master, uh, the, 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 the head honcho of the system, the karate, it was a Shorin Ru karate, um, a very, very traditional Okinawan karate. He came through the drive-thru. <laughs> And he saw me there and he's like, why are you working here? And I go, what do you mean why am I working here? I'm gonna, I'm saving up for this car. And, and he goes, but you could be working at the dojo. And I'm like, I can? He goes, yeah, I'll pay you to teach classes. And like, so I did. So I, I, I did oh work there gosh. for a little while longer, but then I, I went to the, to the uh, school, to the martial arts school, and I taught full time uh, for years and years. And, That's a but I did story. have multiple jobs still. I also worked in a stereo store. I also worked at a local uh, baseball, uh, like for the baseball seasons, I would go and work there. So I always liked having a lot of jobs. And, and then I also started directing those commercials at that same period. Um, so yeah, I had like three or four jobs kind of always uh, going on. But, uh, but martial arts, I guess it was, because I did teach some classes. So it's either martial arts or Taco Bell, toss up between the two, but um, those were the first jobs. 
What a great story. So he, when you went to give him his order, like he said, yeah, I'll have the number I two or whatever. I was working the drive through And right, and then, okay, great. Did you want and the, sauce and the little heads, yeah. And then, and then he, you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's yeah, him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great moment right yeah, there. Yeah, it was. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty funny. And, uh. And just the look on his face, he's like, no, come teach at the school, you know? So, but I, you know what? I think working at Taco Bell also taught me a lot of great lessons. And, sure, people skills, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's uh, uh, all of those, I think all of those things are important. And, and I have kids and I want them to get, you know, they're going to have to earn a car in the same way I did. I had to, I saved up. Now, my parents did help me with some, I think they paid for the insurance and stuff like that on the car. But mm -hmm. um, I think there was something so fulfilling about, that experience and, and earning something like that. I think it was $2,700 at the time for the car. Wow. And I that took me, you know, six months at Taco Bell and, and several more months at teaching martial arts to save up for it, but I did. And I just, <clears throat> I loved that car. I mean, that was, you know, because I earned it, you know? It's the first like bigger item that I earned. So, certainly something in the thousands of dollars, you know? I'd bought, I'd, uh, saved up and bought bikes and things like that, but never, um, you know, I think that's a part of that coming of age and, you know, oh, yeah. all that stuff. So, What was the first song you blasted through the stereos? Because did you get your oh stereo from the stereo store? Of course. Oh, you did? Of okay. course. And I had a really <laughs> big boom in stereo. It was ridiculous. And what was the Absolutely first song? Absolutely ridiculous. Oh, wait, wait. man. Did you go down to like a cruise strip around? Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what it would have been at the time. Um, I, I like know the, smaller towns have that where oh, you like yeah. go in oh, yeah. circles. Oh yeah, and you the, go especially right, yeah. downtown Chico. It's definitely a cruise. <laughs> That's you do a loop, and and we would when I was sixteen, we would do the loop. We would circle several times, and and uh, thought we were very cool uh, with our ridiculous stereos. Um, it's a rite of passage. Yeah, yeah everybody's got definitely, do it. Yeah. definitely <laughs> felt like uh, an eighties version of American Graffiti. Uh -huh, you know, yeah. it was very much that. Um, which is funny because I've shot several movies in Petaluma, and that's American Graffiti was was shot. Uh, some of it was shot there as well. The whole cruising the strip was shot in Petaluma. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I I listen to such a variety of music. I also play music, so I play guitar and bass and mess around on the drums and stuff. So I've always have such a respect for music, kind of in all genres. So I honestly, I you know maybe I don't listen to as much country, but there's still a lot of country that I really view as amazingly you know uh, artistic and talented people performing it so i will listen or maybe it's uh you know opera maybe I, i'm not an opera guy every day on my stereo but there's some amazing music and such amazing talent that i have respect for it so um i'm trying to think of what oh, I mean, everything okay. from tom petty to oh nice okay. to uh, might have been a tom petty song i listened a lot Great. i lo used to love the cars back then oh yeah um, yeah uh-huh I played a lot of that, but then I'd play the opposite end of spectrum. I would play, you know, uh, Bob Marley to Zapp and Roger to Frank Zappa to, you know, like I really, <laughs> I really was, uh, I, I kind of have a very broad spectrum of music that I love. Eric Clapton. I was like obsessed with Eric Clapton when I was 16. Nice. That's kind of, that's when I was really getting into playing the guitar and stuff was listening to everything he did. Um, so, okay. yeah. Probably Tom Petty or something. Probably Free Fallen. Right, okay, probably there you go. Probably blasting yeah. and, you know, <laughs> head out the window like Ace Ventura at the time or something. And the arm, too. Yeah, the arm yeah. Out the oh, yeah. yeah, totally, totally, yeah. When you first moved to Los Angeles and started working, whether it was a little side job or in the industry, did you work any jobs for free? Were you willing to take unpaid work? So, yes, uh, I did lots of pro bono work and just to get experience or... Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Again, you have to do it to a degree because of course you still have to make sure you're doing something to earn, you know, some kind of income to, to pay rent and get some food and all of that. Um, but yeah, there was plenty of times and I did it for years, not every time, but I, something would come up like, hey, this is a unpaid gig, but we, need, we could use some help or, you know, anytime I had the opportunity, once I got a little bit of stability with work, I would still do those um, I don't do it as much anymore just because I don't have the time. Um, but if those windows of time do open up, I, you know, never have an issue with volunteering some time uh, to help somebody out. Um, but yeah, in the beginning, there was a bunch of credit building stuff that I was willing to do. Um, 
Because again, I would view it as a, like, like I said, an education. I knew I was going to learn something and I knew I was going to meet some new people. And those two things are incredibly valuable, especially in this business. Um, you hear all the time, it's who you know. That's 100% true. That is what this business is. It is who you know. It's the relationships you build. It's not necessarily that, oh, somebody's giving favoritism or whatever. I'm sure those things happen too. But it is about if you came and volunteered on somebody's shoot and you did a great job uh, helping them with whatever it was, when they have a paid job, they're going to call you too. You know what I mean? And uh, that's, that's how it works. Um, and, uh, and those friendships and, those, and even just business relationships uh, have almost always led to a paying job in some way, shape, or form. Um, and uh, I tell people all the time when they're asking about getting into this business, like, what's the, what's the best thing I could do? I said, create something. Just create. It doesn't even matter what it is. Put some energy into it. Put some creative energy and create something because you're going to call some friends and see if they're available. They're going to ask some people, whatever. However that's going to work. And you're going to create something. Now you can show people something you've created. And at the same time, you've now strengthened some relationships or maybe met some new people. And that network starts building up of who you know. And, and they now know what you do. And you know it kind of goes from there. Um, I've had people who I hadn't worked with in six years call me up for a job because whatever impression I made way back then, it somehow came around and I came up or they saw me on social media posting something and here's my new, you know, short film on YouTube and they go, oh, I remember him. I worked with him on that, you know, and so it's all about that. It's all about relationship building. So um, doing the free jobs, to me, it, it's always... Um, beneficial if you have the means to do it obviously don't put yourself out on the street because you're taking 20 free jobs and you have no way to pay your bills but within reason um, I say do it because you're going to gain experience and you're also going to gain uh, uh, relationships of those times that you worked for free for credit for something on your wheel whatever how much of that actually led to paid work down the line I think that, that uh, quite a few of them did. And again, I think it has to do with how much energy you're willing to put into something. I never approached a free job as like, ah, it's a free job, I'm gonna half, you know, half-ass this job. I always approached it as, I'm gonna do the best I can do, work as hard as I can to help the project be successful. Um, and I think because of that mindset and attitude, I made enough of an impression on people that that they wanted to hire me for when they got the paying gig or whatever. You know what I mean? So I think, again, I think almost every one of those jobs I met and, and created a friendship or, or working relationship with at least a few people on each one of those sets that then led to me getting called for something else. Even if it was low paying, you know, like, hey, can you help out with this? You know, I enjoyed working with you on that. Can you, uh, you know, I, I'm really trying to think of any of that, that led kind of that never got a phone call that way but um, I just I can't really think of one that didn't I think they all kind of led in some way sometimes it wasn't right away like I said um, uh, but they eventually um, almost all of them led to something positive in that way uh, and again it's I think just chalking it up to to hard work, not being afraid of hard work, you know. Um, luckily, I think, again, my family, my parents ingrained that <laughs> into me enough uh, <laughs> that uh, I've never been afraid to put that work in and, and be the last person on set. And, you know, uh, even as a director, when I can get away with it, I'll help put stuff away. Certain job, you know, union issues, you can't do that. But um, if I am in that situation where I can, I do. And I'll go, why is the director carrying C-stands? Like, because <laughs> we're all in this together. You know what I mean? Um, I, obviously, it doesn't get to work out that way every time. But when it does, I was overseas doing a, a project, and they didn't have the same uh, rules. So I was there loading trucks with all of them, you know, um, and trying not to get in the way, because sometimes you can get in their way. You know, <laughs> like, and now I'm making us go slower because I don't know what I'm doing. But... Uh, you know, when it when it's appropriate, then I try and help out whenever I can. And I love your website in that you you not only have great photos of you on set and things like that, but you you say here's who I've worked with, here's what I do, 
and you really like break it down and I was very impressed with how you did it and you did it, you do it in a fun way where it's not <laughs> it's not like you're you, it's over the top you know I, I I was very impressed with that I don't thank think you. I've seen that before thank you uh, yeah a lot of that credit needs to go to actually my cousin uh, oh, Jeremy nice. Dunn who helped me build that website oh very cool um, and he's really great with that stuff and and uh, and I felt so just humbled that the the actors that I worked with they gave such great quotes I was like oh my gosh I don't know if I deserve this but they they really were helpful in that way and and uh, I really really appreciated um, them putting the time into even putting some of those responses and um, but yeah it was always the goal to kind of just make it presentable and like here's here's what I do and and uh, um, uh, you know, obviously the goal is to make myself hireable, <laughs> yeah. you know, and and, uh, um, and uh, kind of showcase some of the things that I, you know, hopefully help me stand apart uh, maybe from the pack um, with, with my experiences from, from the action side of things to the visual effects side of things. Um, uh, and I think that's also a, an important thing to think about for any aspiring filmmakers is is uh, you know figuring out what you can do that helps you uh, stand apart or um, makes you at least uh, unique in some certain way because uh, those little things can help you know can help you uh, maybe edge edge out the competition for uh, I've certainly had it where um, not only the action side of things have helped get me jobs but also the visual effects side. And the combination of both sometimes has, has helped me um, because, you know, I'll get, hey, you know, we want you to direct this because we know you're also really good at action. I've gotten that call a bunch of times where instead of just hiring a director who maybe doesn't have that experience, it's the combination of those experiences that have helped get me the job. Or like with visual effects, um, I got a pretty big TV series based on my experience with visual effects and obviously directing they liked my directing good that checked that box but now it's a it's a vfx heavy show oh my gosh he's also a vfx consultant like wow okay that checks another box he can work directly with the visual effects artists and make sure that they're shooting it correctly and so that helps just edge me out so having those skills um in for those things are, are what helps me in a lot of situations um to maybe get hired for a job. <clears throat> but it could be many, you know, a variety of, of tool sets that you have. Um, but it's, it's, I think, important to, uh, you know, lean into those things and try and present those things and let, make sure people know that you can do those things. Like, you know, if you're, a, uh, you know, somebody who's amazing with horses or whatever, that could actually be a big skill. I could help you direct a movie about rodeos or, you know what I mean? Like, so all those things are, are kind of important to help you stand out for, for what you do. You know what I mean? And without, of course, naming names, what was one of the worst grunt jobs you ever had? And how did you get through it? Because I, I get the sense that you try to take a positive spin with <laughs> yes, everything, yes. even if it's not positive, yeah, and, and yeah. I admire that. Um, maybe just one that was so unbearable, but somehow you got through it, and I don't know if you took something with you in terms of learning something. or you Yeah, always, always, yeah, always, always learning. I think... I mean, I guess the grip work, is it's a lot of physical work, so that was tough but uh it wasn't like i didn't feel bad you know during the experience so that's tough to say that i i had a great time <laughs> oh, that's good. but that's um good. there's been a there was a job where i was a second ad and just the conditions were so tough i think that was the like below freezing temperatures oh, and then blazing hot in the day we're out in the middle of the mojave desert so and <clears throat> i was asked to be the first ad on it but I kind of got, I don't know how to say it exactly, but I, I just got a bad feeling about the project. So I tried actually not to do it, but I had uh, some, some other friends who really wanted the job, like want, needed the work. And by me turning it down, then I wouldn't be able to get all of them onto the project. So I said, look, I'm not gonna be the first AD because uh, I just, I smell a disaster coming basically. And I said, look, I will help you. I said, why don't you, to one of my friends, I said, how about you be the first AD? I'll be your second. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll help you with whatever you need help with. 
um, uh, if you want to do it. I said, but I'm warning you right now that we probably shouldn't do this. And uh, it just had to do with the people involved and, and lack of experience and the extreme conditions we were going to be in. So I knew that it was going to be difficult in a way that shouldn't be difficult, you know. And that's like in the way of like making sure people are taken care of and all that. And sure enough, we <laughs> trying to survive the, the desert in, in that time that we were in the below freezing temperatures and um, not having adequate uh, things like warming tents and stuff like that to keep cast number one warm and we did end up some people ended up getting hypothermia and yeah it was bad oh. it was bad um but uh we made it through it <laughs> so um but yeah there was uh that was a very very interesting experience and of course i learned a ton from that experience i learned uh chief among them that you know what to accept and not accept um because we said yes to certain things that we should not have said yes to because it, it ended up being um uh dangerous you know like physically dangerous for some for for certain things so um but but again i don't regret the experience because again uh what i learned from it really really helped me literally on i think it was two projects later i'm like nope li here's the life experience i now have from this this is why i won't do this and this is why i think you guys shouldn't do this and they actually listened to me they go okay all right fair enough blah 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 you know so it was actually became a tool for myself on on another project of having that experience and going, look, we had two actresses that got hypothermia. Do you want it? Oh no, we don't. Okay, well then this is what I think you should do. Here's the steps I think that we didn't take on this project that I think should have been taken. And um, so by doing that, I had that experience to draw from. I mean, if the actresses were fine, they they recovered and everything. But um, but uh, yeah, it was that was a difficult one to get through. Probably the most. Uh, probably the most. And I guess as a second idea, I don't know if that's really considered a grunt job, but um, that was the most difficult one, I think. A producer gave you some advice that was pretty lasting? Yeah, so um, I, I was a personal trainer at the time, and I was still, you know, I was doing short films and, and, and all of that stuff. I think I was making my first feature, which was a back alley, you know, group of friends putting their credit cards, you know, into the pot and just making a, making a film. Uh, I think I was doing that at the time. And I was, uh, he was somebody who was very integral developing the Fast and the Furious franchise as well as the, the show um, 24. And uh, he just happened to be one of my clients and, and we, uh, you know, became friends uh, from the whole thing. And he was, Gave me some great advice. Uh, um, and one of the things he he told me was number one, he said, "Don't be a a hole." That was one of the biggest rules. So this business is so small that if you're a jerk, it's going to come back around. Um, so that was one of the first things he told me. <laughs> he's like, and he was very colorful in the way he explained it. But um, he's like that PA that you're working with on set one week, a year later they might be producing the show that you're working on. You know, it's that that's the way this business works. So if you're a jerk to that extra, they might be the star of some show in, in a year or two. So you just never, you know, you should never uh, treat people, you know, poorly. And especially, I mean, that's just in life, but especially in this business because it, it is really so small. You end up going to have to work with the same people again, most likely. And uh, the other thing he told me was if I really wanted to pursue being a creator, a storyteller, a filmmaker, to never be a, you know, no job is too small, never be afraid of, of being the coffee runner or being the in charge of extras or whatever it is, and also to diversify. So the business was changing so much at that time. It was when uh, digital was just coming out. It was kind of taking over everything. Um, and uh, uh, even DVDs and that whole Blu-ray, everything that was, the industry was just shifting and shifting and shifting. So he told me to diversify or die. Those were his exact words. If you want to make it and survive in this business, diversify or die. And I took that to heart. And that's why if you look up my credits, you'll see I've done so many different jobs is because I basically adopted the attitude of uh, 
just not turning down a job. So if I was offered a job and I had the ability to do it and I had the, the time to do it, um, that I would do it. And, and again, it goes back to that viewing it as uh, uh, an, an education. It's like, oh, I'm going to learn about this. And he also told me that same thing of, look, if you learn what it is to be a, a grip, and if you learn what, what it takes to be the, the you know, uh, art department, if you learn those things, it's going to make you a better director because you'll understand what it takes to do those jobs and you'll understand what they're going through to do those jobs. In the same respect of it's a very important for a director to be understand acting because you'll then be able to uh, understand the process or understand that there is a process with actors and be able to sympathize with them or help enable them tell their truth in that role. Same thing with uh, editing as a director. I think it's so important to understand editing because you understand what you're shooting. Um, there are directors who are not editors, um, but I think you need to have a certain understanding of that in order to be effective. It helps you with time management on set. It helps you when you know you have your scene. You know, you don't need to shoot four more angles that you'll never use and be on the cutting room floor because you know you have the scene. It's there. You've got all the pieces you need. Um, so those two things I already knew were important to be a director, but I didn't think about the other stuff. The, the what is the gaffer doing? What is the grips doing? What are the makeup and hair? And, you know, kind of learning all those different departments, it's only going to help you become a better director, is what he told me. And, and uh, so I took that to heart and I took every job I could take. I did everything I could do and, and just felt like it was a, an education for me um, and, and would just help me be better at the job that I was trying to uh, pursue. Do you ever feel guilty turning down work? Um, you mean now? Yeah, my, my, my sense is that you're, you're eager and you love what you do, that if, if an opportunity comes up, you almost feel bad if you can't take it because maybe if you're totally. committed to something else. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh -huh. And uh, what's interesting uh, and, and, and topical right now is that I had to back out of directing a film uh, overseas because of the pandemic. And actually, I was over there when it started getting really bad. I was over there prepping, and ugh, it's going to be a fantastic film. I am uh, now kind of jealous that I <laughs> didn't get to direct it. But um, when this whole thing first came up, I it started getting bad and, and uh, was definitely really worried about getting home because it became uh, one of those things of... Uh, you know, at the time they're like, you know what, we, you could just stay a couple extra weeks and wait it out. And then when it's safe to travel again, you know, it was one of those. And, but what, what ended up happening was the international flights started canceling, like just stopping all international flights. And I went, oof, I think I'm going to have to go home because I can't get stuck here. Uh, I've got a family and all that. So I did, I ended up getting home, uh, and, uh, um, the last weekend where those international flights were flying, I got home wow. and uh, did the quarantine, did all that stuff, got tested, and I was fine. But uh, the it, the whole thing got pushed because of it. and But then it came down to this thing where when they wanted to shoot, it still was just not a safe time to be to go and travel. And, and the worry of being able to get home was so, uh, you know just too big of a worry. It was just too much uh, to, to be able to commit and go there and do it. And I felt horrible turning that down because I had committed to doing this project with, with these wonderful filmmakers and uh, um, uh, some of which I had really dreamed about working with for a long time uh, because they were a big part of Asian cinema like with, with uh, you know, Jet Li and Jackie Chan and all of that. And so I had to turn it down. I felt so, so bad. Um, but obviously it's not under my control. It was out of my control, um, the whole situation. So, but, uh, yeah, I think I do, uh, feel that way because, um, I just enjoy, I enjoy creating and, and helping tell stories in, in whatever the capacity, whether it's, you know, even if it's stunt coordinating, that's still your part of telling that story. You're part of telling the, the story of the action of how it's happening and unfolding. And I just love, I love that process. So, um, uh, and I think there's also 
that element of feeling like you might be able to help somebody uh, and then not being able to, you know, having to say, no, I can't help you. Because <laughs> I get those those uh, calls, uh, you know, fairly often. It's, it's somebody, usually when they're calling me because they need your piece of expertise or something uh, that, you know, you might be able to be that puzzle piece for them. And then when you're not available, uh, obviously that's, that sucks. But I always try and recommend somebody. I'm like, well, call this person. Or I'm definitely that that way as well. I really love to, to if I can't do it, get somebody else the work. You know what I mean? Um, and so I do that. We're going to break the fourth wall here. <laughs> and we are going to title this video, How to Get Four Movies on Netflix in Two Years. Now, we just need you to give us the nuts and bolts of how that happens, and then we can put that title on it. Okay. Um, so now, uh, uh -huh. um, are you saying from start to finish? Yeah. What, what? What? So what are the four movies, and what are their genres? Maybe we'll start with that. Okay, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I was lucky enough to uh, get to direct and, and work on uh, four films that have all been released in this year, 2020, on Netflix, um, which is kind of mind-boggling. I was never planned that way. I think uh, um, this year has brought a lot of curveballs and um, a lot of people are, were looking for a lot of content, so it kind of worked out. But the first movie I did that was released on Netflix was Roped, and it's a kind of coming of age, a uh, little bit of a, like a teen romance. Some have described it as like a Footloose meets, uh, you know, a Western or something, or a rodeo movie. Um, and uh, that was wonderful to work on. Um, and the two leads of that are Josh and uh, Lauren Swickard. At the time, Lauren York, but they actually met and fell in love on the set. There was a real life romance going on at the same time that we were filming that movie. The second movie I did was Lady Driver. That was led by Grace Van Deen. And she's, I think, a wonderful, wonderful actress. I think she's a big, big star in the making. And of course, Sean Patrick Flannery uh, was in that with her as well. And also her dad did a cameo, Casper Van Deen. Um, and uh, that's about a young woman who becomes a race car champion or pursues becoming a race car champion. Um, kind of in her, it's kind of in her family blood. And so again, it's a coming of age. It's her kind of uh, figuring all that stuff out, finding out about her past that she didn't know about. Um, and then after that was this really zany comedy. It's my first feature comedy. Um, I love, absolutely adore comedy. And even in action films, I, I try and put in comedy. I just love the opportunity and the vehicle to try and make people smile in any which way that I can. So um, I had done comedic commercials in the past and I've done short films that are that are comedy, but never a feature. So this was my first feature comedy and I had an absolute blast making. It's probably the most fun I've ever had on a set. The uh, actors in Matt Jones and Noreen DeWolf and uh, Maddie Carteropel and uh, um, uh, um, they're just were so funny that you know, in front of the camera, off the camera, they're so funny that just the whole experience was just absolutely hilarious. And, and John Ducey, who wrote it, who's also in it, um, he's hilarious. And uh, and his wife, uh, Christina Moore, is also in it. So they're just all so such a funny cast, um, uh, along with Ali Afshar. Um, that uh, that one's that one's kind of a I don't know if many people will know this movie, but there's a movie called. Uh, um, uh, Brewster's Millions, and it's the, basically the the nuts and bolts of it is uh, strange father um, leaves his fortune and his will to uh, to his his son, and uh, um, in our movie the son uh, he has two other siblings who believe they should be the heirs to the to the family fortune, but on his deathbed the father leaves a challenge for his his estranged son to be able to uh, get the family fortune if he competes in these races across the country and he has to podium. It's totally not believable, it's totally over the top, but basically he has to go across the country and compete in different races from motorcycle, like motocross, to uh, drag, bra uh, drag boats, to monster trucks. I mean, like we did, we went across the gambit of the, the racing world and just had a blast with it. 
Um, and then the last one is, uh, which just came out, is California Christmas. And that's just a very sweet um, kind of rom-com Christmas movie. And uh, that again stars Josh and Lauren Swickard. And uh, this time she wrote the script. Um, Lauren Swickard wrote it and produced it and uh, along with Ali Afshar. But it was a great reunion with uh, them both acting in it, now married. And um, uh, we became very, again, what we talked about earlier about you know the relationships you build, it really, that's exactly what this was all about. We had a great experience on one project and we were trying to figure out what to do you know, in the future when the time was right, what can we do again together? And this is the vehicle that came up for that. And uh, I jumped at the chance. As soon as I got called and said, hey, do you want to direct another movie with Josh and Lauren? I'm like, yes. What is the, well, first, obviously I got to read the script, but almost like not even knowing the script, it was already like a yes. Like, you know, yes, I want to do another film with them because it was just such an enjoyable experience. And, and, uh, this one, it's the big city guy comes and he's trying to buy the property from the from the the ranch uh, from the young woman who who uh, uh, owns the ranch, and so it's that kind of thing. And he gets dragged into doing work on the on the ranch, and of course they fall in love, and uh, you know it's that kind of thing. But there's some good little twists in it, and there's some really fun characters that are unexpected uh, in there, and uh, you know you've got uh, David Del Rio. Uh, who's a really great comedic actor, um, just a great actor in general, but he's also really, really good at comedy. Um, and uh, <laughs> he's really funny in this movie. So um, we had a lot of fun with that. And uh, yeah, they all, all of them <laughs> ended up on Netflix uh, this past year and or this year. And that was, uh, uh, felt just very blessed that that uh, is a reality, you know, that that happened. Wasn't expecting it. Um, you know, you're, you're making these movies, you don't necessarily know when they're going to come out. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they all did. And so how does that happen? Is that something where you knew up front that you were making these to eventually be on Netflix? A distributor got them on? The producer had inroads? Yeah, so the first three, no. Um, the first three, we didn't know exactly what the distribution path would be. Uh, California Christmas is a Netflix original, so yes, we did know from the get-go on that one, um, and there's that collaboration. Um, so that was really exciting when we were doing it too, just knowing that we that that that's going to be the home. This is, you know, uh, uh, just a really and obviously then there's the pressures of making sure you do it right and do it justice and and make them happy and everything. But um, the first three, no, we we. We made them with, you know, obviously Netflix would be a, a, a great place for them to land. So you shoot for those, shoot for that as a goal, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously there's uh, Amazon and there's Hulu and there's uh, there's theatrical. There's, you know, just going a traditional route like, you know, iTunes or whatever. So there's all sorts of different uh, avenues you could go. Um but I definitely think Netflix was a goal place to try and get them. Uh, and luckily with the relationships uh, that uh, the production team and um, like our producers, uh, like Ali Afshar, um, it, the relationships he's built uh, ha helped us get us into those doors um, and, and ultimately get, um, uh, you know, find their home there. Has, has he had other movies on Netflix? Did he already have a pre-existing relationship? So... Um, I think with Roped, the, several of them got released the same day. So I think it was a, a um, kind of a little bit of a package deal there. So I'm not exactly sure if there was anything before that that had made it onto Netflix. I think those were the first ones. So no, not necessarily. But um, relationships with, with like we kind of have a, a kind of loose partnership, like sales partnership with Warner Brothers. So that relationship was already established. Um, and so I think it was through that relationship. Again, some of this stuff is above my pay grade, um, but I do know that we, we have partnered, especially on the sales end of things with Warner Brothers in the past. And so that has been kind of a, um, a very good relationship there with, with several movies. And then when it came to this, um, again, I am 
I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think that was the 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 relationship that then uh, bridged into Netflix. So so Ali has these relationships, and is this from? I know he has a racing does something with racing. So yeah, so okay. yeah, Ali Ali um, is uh, again. He, now I've done more movies with him than I've done with anybody else. So our partnership, him producing, me directing, uh, I've done five films with him. Um, and uh, obviously I keep coming back because I love working with him. And uh, again, it's another really just great friendship that has developed um, uh, over the years. And so um, uh, he started, he's got a great story. So he uh, grew up in Northern California. I also grew up in Northern California. So there's a little bit of that you know, bond there. But he uh, got into racing uh, kind of in a roundabout way, but I mean, he was always into racing, but how he got sponsorships and everything was him and his team, his buddies, they figured out uh, how to um, take a Subaru and uh, modify it in a way to be obviously incredibly fast, but compete in drag racing. And at that time, Subaru, they're rally racing and they did other th other kinds of racing, but came nowhere near drag racing. But the way, how he was able to figure out how to take, I believe it was a six cylinder and like drag race with these huge muscle cars and win was kind of uh, revolutionary and especially for, uh, for Subaru themselves. And so um, if I'm remembering the story correctly, they came out to meet him and he took them in the car and showed them what it could do and they wanted to sponsor him. So he traveled the world, did all these races and, and got even, you know, more advanced with the Subarus and took them to like world record holding numbers. And he, uh, I believe he still holds some world records with t his team in Subaru um, with the drag racing. So he did really well for himself there and through different sponsorship deals, it's how he met other sponsors who then became hey, why don't we make some movies together? Would you want to make a movie about race cars? You know what I mean? So it became that. That's how he kind of got into that whole world. And I think he had also just done some acting on the side because that was another passion of his. Um, I know he was on like King of Queens. He, he kind of had a character who would come back ever so often. And I know he did some, some stuff early on as well. I don't know where that overlaps with him making movies and all of that, but... Um, he kind of tried to marry his two loves, I think, which was racing and acting and and uh, and all of that. So um, they ended up making a couple race car movies first, okay. um, and then that started bridge, bridging out from there. Started expanding into other stories to tell, not just racing. But we do always kind of come back to the racing too, because that is obviously a big passion of his. So even like our comedy Wheels of Fortune um, that I was describing earlier, it's obviously all the different race car elements. I mean. From the motorcycles to the boats to the off-road trucks to the you know, it's uh, um, we do find ways to, to do do stories that uh, also involve the racing. Right. So interesting. So he has this sort of mindset of of finding sponsors and and partnering what he loves to do with these bigger companies. And he's so really he, good at that. He, okay. Again, he's really good at those relationship building and right. and uh, that we talked about earlier. He's uh, he's very personable, very nice guy, all of those things, and 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 has great ideas, and has you know this incredible ambition, and and uh, I think his energy is infectious that way as well. So I think um, he attracts uh, those kinds of uh, people that with like-minded uh, you know energy and want want to create these things, and so um, I think he's produced. It's really hard to keep track of them all. I think he's produced 16 movies and uh, two television series now, and all within a matter of you know uh, five years or something like that, or maybe even under that. So um, yeah, when he sets his mind to those things, he's he really excels. And then luckily, I was able to to partner uh, with him, and that was through um, again it, we, we talk about how uh, work begets work, right? So um, it was an actor. Uh, named Shane Graham, who's also a wonderful actor. I think he's a big star as well, and he's he's doing really great work. He's got a movie right now called Ride, which is on Amazon, and uh, that one's doing really really well. 
And again, that's the same same filmmaker. Ali Afshar is also the producer of that. So he had just finished filming that when he came on to a TV series I was directing, and uh, we became fast friends. And he uh, said, "Man, I got to introduce you to these other filmmakers." And he, in kind, told them, "You've got to meet this director, Sean. You know, I think you guys would get along great." So it's really him helping bridge that relationship. And then. Um, some of the producers, not Ali, came to set and actually uh, the other director, the other uh, main director for for Ali's company, ESX Entertainment, uh, Alex uh, Renner Ravello, has directed, I think he's directed like at least 10 movies with them. I've Knuckle done five. He's, yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. And uh, <laughs> um, so he um, he came to set. He came to visit. It's almost like the the... You know, if if he approved of me, then they would take a meeting with me, type of thing. And he was lovely, and and uh, he came to set and visited when we were we were launching some B twenty five bomber. It was a World War II thing, and uh, I was like, perfect day for him to come see. <laughs> we're doing some really cool stuff, you know. So he came and visited, and and uh, luckily he reported back that that I seemed like a, you know a, maybe a good match for them as well so I went out to Warner Brothers and and met up with Ali and and again I think we we hit it off right away and I really liked the story the the movie that they were um, uh, talking to me about directing at the time is called American Fighter um, and that comes out in early early 2021 it's it's finally coming out so that one's been uh, it's been a while since we uh, first started that one, but it's finally coming out. Um, I believe in March is when that one's going to come out. But um, so I met with them, and luckily they they uh, liked me enough, and and uh, the rest is history. I then did four more movies after that one with them, and hopefully more. Knock on wood. Uh, I would love to do, uh, of course, more projects with them. Wow, that's really fascinating. So, because I think Ali, when I read his bio, it said he he was going to med school and then he became he wanted to be an actor instead, and then the race car driving came in there, and then is that cause that's fascinating that he yeah. would then yeah, he's, find the sponsorship and that would take him back to acting. Yeah, basically. yeah, 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 yeah. It's really, yeah. Uh, it's really uh, amazing, and he's a great producer that way. I mean, he. He's, he's just one of those people that any problem, even, you know, I, I view myself as a great problem solver, but I even run into certain issues that, you know, maybe I can't tackle. He comes in and it's, and he fixes it. You know, I, we were shooting Lady Driver and the, it had just rained and we were on this, it's this really nasty kind of clay that just will, your cars will sink in it and all that kind of stuff and, and you won't get them out. Like, it's one of those things. So... It had rained a couple days before we were at this racetrack, and we're supposed to film everything in their in their race pits. Um, and but the problem is, it had rained a couple days, and the 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 track the guy running the track was like, I don't think you can bring these big heavy, you know, production trucks and vehicles on here. And he goes, we'd have to bring in a tractor, and we'd have to like, you know, lay down some, like like till it up and lay down some more stuff and blah blah blah. And I'm like, well, where are we going to film this? You know, like this is here. Today is, here's our schedule. This is what we're supposed to film on this day. And I kept talking to the guy going, what can we do? Where can we film it? Can we do it here? Or is there any way to, to make it work there? Can we bring the tractor? He goes, no, I don't think it can happen. Then my producer, my like field producer comes in. He's talking to him. Nope, can't happen. Nope, can't happen. Everybody, nope, can't happen. Here comes Allie. What's wrong? What's going on? I go, well, because it rained here. We can't get the vehicles out there as well. He goes, he goes okay, hold on. Up. He goes, Two minutes, he's over there talking to the gentleman, comes back, goes, yeah, we're going to be able to film there. I go, what? How did you make that happen? He's just one of those people that just, you know, makes those kinds of things happen. Of course, the guy got the tractor. He did all the work. <laughs> you know, I don't know I don't know what they said or what was talked about, but, you know, he was able to, to make that happen, and we filmed the whole day where we were supposed to film it, and, and it all worked out. And, uh, and, yeah, so very interesting. Sean, can you further explain how you got the first two films on Netflix. Yeah, so I think the, the first couple films that we got on there had to do with the relationship with Warner Brothers and them kind of being the, handling the sales of the films, if that makes sense. So um, they're the ones who, and I say they, I really, again, a lot of this is above my pay grade, but um, I know it was the relationship with Warner Brothers representing the films to sell them. 
and they sold it to Netflix. So that's how they got it on there. And I believe it was a package deal. Again, it's above my pay grade, but um, uh, I believe that's how the first couple of films got on there. And, and of course, then the relationship builds, and then we got a couple more on there, and that went really well for us. And then, you know, now we've got the newest one, California Christmas, that just came out. So I think we have... Um, it's not just my four films uh, with the same company, with ESX and Ali's, Ali's company. I think we now have seven films on there, on Netflix. So it's been a, it, the relationship, obviously, through Warner Brothers has built, and it's been really, really fantastic. Yeah, sorry, how did you get the first relationship going with Warner Brothers? And I know you that said part's that, not, I have no you, clue. You have no clue. Yeah, okay. that's, that's, okay. Uh, that's all Ali. Right. Uh, right. That's okay. his relationship. So I don't know how that all started. Right. You've been a director for hire on all four movies that have gone to Netflix. Were you competing with other directors at that time for the job? Um, I do know. Um, yes, I think there's always been other directors in consideration. Uh, a few of them know. I think we just, from the get-go, we knew that I was going to do it, and that's because we had already established that relationship. Um, but yes, there was other... I guess because American Fighter was the first film I directed with them, and there was other directors being considered, uh, but that one hasn't come out yet. That one's not on Netflix yet. That one is releasing uh, again in March. Um, so that one I knew I definitely was competing, uh, and then there's always there is also Alex Rena Ravello who has directed a bunch of movies with them. So it's kind of like, are you going to direct this one? Are you going to direct? You know, and we also have Brett Headland who has been the editor on all of our films. He also directed a film for ESX um, called The Stand at Paxton County, uh, which I helped develop that script. Um, but he ended up uh, directing it uh, because I was directing uh, Wheels of Fortune. So I think, yeah, there's those things and, and uh, certain ones, uh, yes, there's other uh, in consideration. And then other ones, it's been, you know, hey, we love what you do. We want you, you know, we think you could tell the story really well. And so I just get offered it. Um, but certainly in the beginning, there was definitely more of that, um, uh, considering other directors for the projects. Did you personally meet with anybody at Netflix? Did you go to Netflix? Can you I tell have us? not. No, oh, you again. haven't? Okay. No, yeah. I've, I haven't had any. I have met with people from Netflix before, but not for these movies. Um, uh, again, uh, being the director, I'm not the producers of them. I'm not, I don't have, I am very uh, involved in the post-production process. From everything, editing, visual effects, sound design, ADR, score. I I'm, I I'm have my fingers in every single part of that. Uh, but, and making sure that the deliverables uh, get done. But beyond that, like I said, it's kind of above my pay grade and um, I'm not involved on that level. Now, if it be something that I produced, then that might be more the case. And I have had those conversations with films that are, I have personally produced, you know, that are through my stuff. But but um, uh, I did have a movie long ago on Netflix, but it was when there were still DVDs that they would send to your house. Um, so anyways. I remember those days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's exciting to check yeah. the mail. Um, how much involvement does Netflix have during production? I know you said it with California Christmas. Yeah, this is, our first, this is our first... Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Netflix original. So yeah, there is a certain involvement. And again, Warner Brothers, uh, they're, they're also those relationships there, um, kind of overseeing, making sure everything's going good and, and all that. I think because of when we filmed this, we were one of the first films after this pandemic has started to come back and film. Uh, there was TV shows, some docu-series that had been going, uh, but we were one of the first film film productions to go back in. So I think there's... Uh, because of those reasons, uh, it, it's maybe a different experience than it would have been uh, prior to this. Um, so there's not a whole bunch of people that are just randomly come into sets. Like everything is very small, controlled. Um, there was some, you know, Zoom sessions in, those kinds of things from, from more of the executives, uh, you know, in that regard. But ESX was in charge of producing the product. But yes, from script levels to overseeing, sending clips, sending daily, you know, whatever it is, their involvement is that way. But not um, coming to set and, and uh, overseeing it in that respect. At least not on this. Again, like I said, I think because of um, uh, 
just the current uh, world affairs that that uh, um, it was more from afar. You know what I mean? Sure. But so you were sending them dailies. I don't know if it was dailies or like certain scenes, cut together scenes here that show you a sample, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but the way that we do dailies now, it's all digital, it's all up on there. So again, I'm not sure what sent to who because I'm so razor focused on filming and getting the stuff done. Um, but very likely it could have been sent to them to review. Yeah. And they reviewed the script and gave you notes? Yes, yeah, yeah. All that stuff was, uh, of course, they have to have... Uh, approval on all that kind of stuff. Sean, forgive me for asking this, but the timeline, can we just go over that one more time uh, for these movies? Because it sounds like this happened so fast. Yeah, this year has been very interesting. Uh, again, I think I think because people are so starving for content, it's why so many of my projects uh, came out. Uh, but Roped and Lady Driver kind of came out at the same time on Netflix. And uh, so those were already out. Then uh, we were already in development and, and working on A California Christmas before Wheels of Fortune came out. So we are actually on set filming A California Christmas. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, it was after A California Christmas stopped filming when uh, um, I was on a different television, or a different uh, project when uh, Wheels of Fortune came out. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it was had a couple of them on there. We... I don't remember if the, I think the deal was in place when we started filming California Christmas for Wheels of Fortune to come out. Um, but it didn't come out until after we were done filming it. And then, you know, A California Christmas is the one we had the clearest like date of when we were, it was going to release because it's a holiday movie. We knew December, they wanted it to come out in early December uh, to play through for the holidays. So, um, but on like Wheels of Fortune, we didn't know what the date exactly would be, when when Netflix would want to drop it, when they want to release it. Obviously, I'm sure they have specific, you know, reasons for when they want to to release uh, movies. Um, but I do believe we had the deal for for Wheels of Fortune while you know before we started filming uh, California Christmas, if I'm not mistaken. Again, a lot of this stuff is I I don't get to deal with it. I don't get the inside information on that. But um, but yeah. Uh, so I had two films already, but also ESX, I believe, already had four films on uh, on Netflix already released before we started doing the California Christmas uh, project. And that just came out today. Yeah, it yeah. came out today. Yay. Woo! When was the production for California Christmas? So we started filming, um, I'm trying to remember the exact date, but it was in July. Of 2020? Uh, July of 2020, yeah. Oh, okay. So it was a very quick turnaround from filming to <laughs> release. Um, uh, it was, it was uh, we were working 24-7 to try and get it uh, finished through post and delivered. Because we had to deliver in, I think, late October um, was, was the requirement for delivery if it was going to air in, in December. So um, uh, it was a very, very fast turnaround. So, but yeah, we started filming in, in January. And uh, of course, we had to get um, everything approved through SAG and all of that with the COVID protocols and, and, and all of that. And assuming it was filmed in California, correct? Yes, okay. it was filmed in California, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay. yeah what in, were the protocols? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say up in Northern California, Petaluma and oh, nice. Sonoma and those surrounding areas is where beautiful. we filmed. It was beautiful. I felt so lucky and blessed that, number one, I was getting to work during this time because there's so many people who can't work. Um, uh, and that was certainly the case before I got to film this. I hadn't been able to do any physical production, obviously, for months and months. Oh, really? Sorry to interrupt, but you sat, you were at home probably? Yeah, I was able to do some other work and I had post work to do and things like that. So uh, I still was keeping myself busy, but um, yeah, not, not going and physically filming anything. Um, so I felt very lucky to be able to do that. And yes, we had to have a very extensive plan. Number one, just to show to SAG and Dan Daniel Aspermonte, who is one of the producers on it, he put together this very detailed, highly detailed plan of how we would shoot it, how we would keep everybody safe, and uh, a very impressive uh, plan that he put together. And uh, because the movie is a little bit more self-contained, it focuses on these two actors who happen to be married in real life, 
that helped with, you know, certainly getting things approved when they got approved. Because we were, uh, like I mentioned before, one of the first features to, to, to film um, uh, since this whole thing kind of started, since, you know, shutdowns happened. And so, um, uh, but yeah, it was very interesting. It was a whole different world uh, as far as filming goes um, with the COVID protocols. Number one, we were tested like every other day. Um, on set? The, the, on set, the good wow. old nose swabs. Wow. And uh, we had more medics on set. Um, uh, and also uh, we're temperature checked. When we arrived, we were temperature checked before we left every night. Um, just you know, highly diligent. We wore face masks, of course. Um, if we were in close proximity with the actors, we'd also have the shields. So we'd have mask and shield on. Uh, and to that effect, nobody was really allowed to go get close to the actors while they were on set, other than the camera, the, the camera operators and or DP and myself, the director. And maybe the AD, first AD. Um, uh, were really the only people that could get in close proximity with the actors when they didn't have their masks on. So we had to follow those rules. Um, there was also zones. So, uh, you know, only a certain amount of people total could be in any zone at one given time. So obviously set itself or base camp would be the hottest zones. It's where the most people would be. But we tried to keep that all separate. And on top of all of this, we had a uh, COVID officer. So we had somebody on set who was overseeing this stuff and making sure we were keeping socially distant um, and that we were, had our masks up that they don't fall down over our nose and you know you got a bunch of people with their noses out. He was he's on it. Uh, Matt, wonderful gentleman who was our COVID officer, um, he was overseeing all of that and making sure uh, that we were following all the rules and. Um, and he actually did it in a very pleasant way. It's not like he was yelling at people, hey, your mask is down. No, he's very, very kind about it, but he's very diligent as well. He's on top of it. I mean, you really, you know. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I forgot to mention is when the actors are on set, no, none of the other departments can come and work with them on set, even including wardrobe and makeup. They would have to leave set first to be able to be checked like outside, things like that as well. Like when we were indoors, they have to have all the doors open. You know, it's like all of those things uh, uh, to, to be um, very diligent with that stuff. And then like, let's say we need to adjust a light. Well, the actors would have to step off set first, be cleared, then the uh, electricians can come in, the, the uh, and grip department can come in and they can fix a light or whatever. But the really cool thing that Brad Rushing, our DP, thought about in all of this, and I thought it was genius, was they, he decided to try and light from outside as much as possible. So bringing in light sources from outside, whether it's backlighting the actor from like, you know, it's sunlight or artificial sunlight coming through a window or however it was designed, he tried to design a lot of it uh, coming from outside and the lights that were inside were remote. So we had our uh, gaffers in our lighting department. They could adjust everything like on iPads and things like that. They were able to dim and do different things. They were able to do a lot without needing to physically go on set and have to remove the actors because that, of course, all takes extra time. So I thought that was pretty genius to, to approach it that way um, and, and help us keep our, keep our schedules, you know. Did, did you notice that you would tend to shoot outside more or no? I was just wondering if that was something. Part of that, that was part of the design, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, we did think about that early on with these protocols, try and limit the amount of scenes that need to be shot indoors. And again, you know, trying to keep it more open space. And when we did go into like a bedroom or something like that, the crew became very minimal. So uh, again, with the COVID officer, we worked with him to figure out, well, how many people can be upstairs safely? And it wasn't about like, <clears throat> how many people, you know, can we get in? We want to get in as many as we can. It was literally about like, what is a real safe, you know, like what's the real number? Can we only have five people up here? You can have two people in that room and you can have three people in this room. You know what I mean? So we kind of became that dance. And then everybody else has to stay downstairs or outside, you know? So it was that thing. So there was a lot of things to juggle that you don't normally have to. Yes, they add time. The testing adds time to your, like actually takes away time from your shoot day. Um, so you have to account for all of those things. But what I will say is it sounds daunting. It sounds like, oh, this isn't gonna work. Uh, but 
what I will say is that the the crew and the new people, the 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 people dealing with the COVID testing and all of that, we all got into a rhythm. You know, first couple of days, obviously it's rougher, but we all got into a rhythm. And by the end, we were all just firing on all cylinders, and you know, came everybody came and got their tests. That you know, it just just you know, we came together and we made it happen. Um, and uh, and everybody worked really hard. You had to work hard because the other the other thing about it is we had less crew because you can't have too many people. So that can put strain on the different departments. Like now they have one less or two less people than they normally have. So again, luckily we have a team of people that really aren't afraid of hard work and they put in the hard work and they all deserve all the accolades they can get because they really do put in a tremendous amount of work. And that's why I keep working with the same team, I think, because we share that common goal of you know all trying to make something as good as we can especially whether it's limited resources or time or um but they all just work really really hard and and uh i think we're able to accomplish really great things uh even in the um you know uh, constraints of working in, during this time is the covid officer someone you're hiring off mandy or one of these sites or is this someone from the state that's a great question. I'm not qualified to answer. I don't know. Um, uh, the producers, they handled all of that. Um, it is definitely a, somebody who's certified within that. You know, I don't even know all the certifications, but they're, uh, I, yeah, again, I don't really know, but I know that they are very, they're certified. They're, they're up with all the testing, like the latest test. Like the, when we were filming, the tests were changing. And we had always the latest and greatest, the best or whatever it was. Uh, we started when we first showed up, we were doing blood tests. And then it became, uh, we were doing the finger prick stuff at the beginning. And then that morphed into just doing the nose swabs. And then there was different levels of nose swabs. And you know, like it was very interesting, but they're always at the like forefront of whatever it is that's gonna be the best, have the highest accuracy, you know, all those things. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was very, very interesting. And, and, uh, that whole team, so not just himself, but there's a whole team behind it. They all were wonderful. And, and obviously, uh, their job was to try and keep us safe. Um, and, you know, luckily they did. <laughs> what about crew feed? How is that done? Cause you know, normally it's going to be yeah, like a buffet all, style. That, that all changed too. Yeah. So, uh, everything is kind of individually packaged. So, and, and we have caterers and stuff like that, that, that um, craft services was very, definitely very different. So everything has to be individually wrapped. Uh, you're not, you can't go through and thumb through and touch a bunch of stuff. You have to figure out what you're gonna choose. <laughs> that bag of Fritos, now that you touch that bag, it's your bag, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the, the, probably the biggest bummer is like, I always like to have like fresh fruit and stuff like that. They can't really do that um, uh, with these protocols. So unfortunately, unless you brought it your own in your own bag, you know, which I did, I brought bananas and apples of, of myself. Um, but uh, yeah, that was very different. And again, the lunches are very different. You could only have, everybody was spaced out like this, you know, the seating area. You can't have everybody bunched in and always outside basically. Um, and, um, but yeah, the, the lunches, uh, and the meals were all just kind of like in their own little, kind of package, you know, individual portions and packaged and, and it was fine. It, you know, it was, uh, uh, it just became, you know, kind of standard after the first week we, everybody was used to it. What was the shooting schedule? Uh, so the shooting schedule was, um, uh, we usually do like five on two off type of thing. And I think we had one six day, uh, maybe we had two. Um, we really, it was it was a pretty short schedule. That's the other, uh, I think, reason why we got approved so early on is it was a limited amount of days. So that's another thing that they were looking for. Like, you know, what's the shortest amount of time you can film this in to to limit, uh, you know, uh, you know, risk of somebody getting infected. So um, I think we had about 15 days uh, for this shoot, all in, like all together, which is not a lot of time <laughs> to film a movie. But again, like I said, we have a great crew that helps us um, accomplish those goals.
what was the last day of shooting? And then I'm not sure again what the day for deliverables was. I think in October. How much yeah, time gosh, did you have? Yeah, gosh, I have to look when the when the last day of shooting was. Um, I think we were just about um, just rolled over into August, or just right before um, August. I can't remember exactly the date, but yeah, from that time to getting it delivered, you know, was was we usually have twice that amount of time to get it done. However many months that is, what is that? Uh, it's basically the end of October is when we had to deliver, um, if my memory is serving me correctly. And uh, so not only, we, so the good thing was is that the editor had started the process while we were filming. So as we were still filming, as they got footage delivered to them on hard drives through the mail um, or couriers, they would get the footage. Uh, Brett Headland was the the editor. He would get it and then process it and then start cutting the scenes. So um, that was all happening. You know, it's offset by obviously a few days. Um, but then once he gets rolling, he's just you know getting the new footage and continuing to try and put the the pieces together. And uh, by the time we finished shooting, it wasn't far after that that we had the first rough cut. Um, and so, and then I, once I was finished filming, I got to look at the cuts and start, and we break it up in reels. So I started reviewing the reels, giving my notes, figuring out what tweaks we can do, or if we're missing a piece, you know, how, do, how are we going to solve that? And um, so from the editing, just getting the, the picture cut, then to the sound design, to the score. I mean, uh, uh, Jamie Christopherson, who did our score, he had such a small amount of time to do the score. I was blown away at, with the speed at which he was able to do it. And we had several original songs in there that he produced, along with uh, Caitlin Epperly, who is in the movie, but she also sings several original songs for it. And while we were filming, he had to be helping create those, like rough versions for her to perform and lip sync live to uh, while we were filming it, but that meant those songs had to be done. And so that whole decision that, she, that we were going to do these original songs and, you know, from that time to filming those actual scenes was so short amount of time. I was blown away. He was able to do it. And of course they were rough versions of the song, but they still sounded fantastic. And of course they went in, they did, they even re-recorded some of the vocals and did things after the fact, but to, to get that, and, and we had to have her go and record her audio for it, and so it was this this uh, pretty amazing dance that happened, but but it all worked out beautifully. And um, uh, then getting people in ADR, which was really interesting because um, we couldn't bring everybody in. Like, like, even for myself, I didn't go into the studio for the ADR. I did it from home, and so did a lot of our actors. They didn't go to the studio either. They were either abroad or some of them were in their hotel rooms doing ADR for us, you know. We'd either send a microphone or, or you know, somehow get it that way. And uh, it was really, really interesting. I'd never experienced anything like that. But from, from doing it like that, all remote, to even the color correction sessions remotely, all doing it over Zoom, and now we've all got a much shorter time to do it. It was a incredibly challenging but again everybody just rose to the challenge and I think that's a lot of of you know the positive stories out of 2020 that I've seen is people rising to challenges and it's really to me it's inspirational obviously I try and look at the glass half full versus empty that's just my personality but um, I really have seen some amazing things come out of this year of such tragedy and obviously so many uh, hardships and, and so much that has gone wrong in this year, I've seen how people have risen to that challenge and just it's been inspirational in that respect. Do you think it reminds you of, of how you do things? Because I could see you always wanting <laughs> to problem solve yeah. and fix it and, yeah. and, and being successful at that. Yeah, I, that I think like there's probably at some level there there is me seeing... Uh, you know, people maybe problem solve in, in the way that makes sense to me. <laughs> so yeah. maybe maybe that's what uh, uh, attracts me to, to, to seeing that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I certainly think my, uh, again, I go back to my martial arts. I think 
martial arts itself, at least what I have been able to study and the teachers that I've been lucky enough to, to train under, is it's all about problem solving. So it, that's 100% of what it is, um, you know, whether you're fighting an opponent or not, or nothing confrontational, because martial arts, again, from what the way I've been taught, is it goes much beyond combat. There, there is that aspect of it. There is self-defense. There is the sport element of it. But beyond that, it's, it's kind of philosophy and problem solving. And it helps you in all walks of life. And I think it certainly has helped me in filmmaking. Sean, how do you feel about you filmed this movie in July of 2020? It's now mid-December 2020. And today it's the first day it's on Netflix. Um, I have to say it's actually a really good feeling. Um, because a lot of times in filmmaking, uh, as you guys probably well know, um, it can take a long time from inception to, to release, uh, in some cases years. And that's certainly been the case, uh, for a lot of my movies. Um, some of them are three plus years before they end up, uh, coming out and even big blockbuster movies, they have similar tales. Some of them are three plus years. Um, other movies kind of get shelved for a while. It could be five years before they come out. So to have something that you work on within the same year, and it, I mean, even like basically a, less than six months, uh, kind of go from inception to release, it, it feels great. <laughs> it's really nice to see something uh, and, and hopefully get a good response. And with, just today it's released, but I've already gotten really, really nice and, and sweet responses. And, and uh, that's just uh, an amazing feeling and uh, a feeling that I hope any creator gets to uh, experience at some point. Um, because the, I, I also remember every inch of the set and every second, every minute of, of that production because it's still so fresh in my brain. And to go from that to seeing people's reactions to it this quickly it's a, it's a, it's kind of you know endorphin inducing feeling. It feels really wonderful. I had a great morning waking up to uh, getting some of those messages, and um, with some of the other movies, it's been like three years. It's really hard to remember. You know, I remember certain moments, but it's obviously not the same thing. It's it's been a long time uh, since uh, you know working on those projects. As a director, does Netflix pay you residuals? Oof. No, <laughs> and I don't know if that's true for, for every film, of course, um, but at least at the level I'm at and, and with these films, no, there's no residuals um, for that. And I don't know if that's the same for actors. So I think actors with SAG and all of that, obviously there's a much different uh, probably uh, deal there. I'm trying to remember, because um, there was, there was um, negotiations for streaming at some point. I'm trying to... I'm bad with keeping up on all the latest uh, information with that. Um, but for myself, no. If a group of young filmmakers came to you and said they wanted to make movies only for Netflix, what would you advise them in terms of story, production, budget? Um, yeah, for Netflix, that's interesting because it's kind of this ever-moving thing. So uh, in, in what trends on there, um, I would say that Netflix, at least in my experience or my perception of it, is it is a little bit more kind of an algorithm-based thing. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's uh, almost like a YouTube, but not I mean not the same as YouTube, but but very much like what uh, attracts viewership and uh, and things like that is a little bit more. It, it is constantly changing. So that's a hard one to, to figure out. I think um, Netflix also does things on, on all spectrums. I mean, they have movies that are made at a couple million. They have movies that are made at 100 million. So it's really hard to kind of pinpoint exactly uh, what to say would work to help you get, get it sold onto Netflix other than just, you know, try and make stories that uh, uh, resonate with with an audience um obviously try and make it the, the it's got to be of a certain standard certain quality um so i think those are goals to shoot for um but yeah that's a tough one to say i think there's probably 
uh, the two spectrums of, of budget levels. Um, you've got the ones that you probably want to keep you know, under a certain amount because then, then the sale to Netflix makes sense. Um, because if you make it for too much, you're never going to get that amount back, if that makes sense. Um, but then on the flip side, if you've got, you know, big name actors in it, you know, whoever that might be, a Will Smith or something, then obviously those numbers completely change. So you could make a $50 million movie and still sell it and it would make sense on Netflix. But again, I think a lot of those are more of the Netflix originals as well, that they're willing to put in that kind of, uh, um, that kind of a commitment, um, for a big, big movie like that. Um, I don't really see them going after the, you know, more uh, low, low budget stuff like the, the sub one million dollar films. But again, I could be wrong because I just don't know all the inner inner workings of it. Um, uh, but uh, they definitely also have parameters in place for uh, your gear. So I'd say first and foremost, if that's really your goal. Probably the best advice I could say was find out the specs that they require because they actually do really require certain specs. Like it, I believe it has to be shot in 4K minimum, um, and they ha literally have gear approved. They have a gear approved list for Netflix, like what you can film on, what cameras they approve, uh, and things like that. So they actually do have some technical aspects that you could <laughs> kind of. Uh, um, lack of a better word, screw yourself out of ever getting a Netflix deal if you don't meet certain parameters. Uh, again, I don't know exactly what all those are, and they do change, but um, I do know that there are certain, like uh, uh, I believe the Black Magic Pocket cameras are actually approved for Netflix. So something on that level, which is still affordable, uh, and and uh, you know to a certain degree. Are still at enough quality level to be approved by a Netflix. I believe. Again, don't quote me on any of this, but mm. um, uh, but there are certain ones that aren't for whatever reason. It doesn't meet the specs. Um, maybe the color space isn't deep enough. Doesn't have enough bits or whatever. Um, so that would be the starting point. <laughs> like, make sure you check with that kind of stuff and 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 make your goals of, of filming it to to meet those certain parameters. Um, other than that, I think they uh, they obviously um, you know uh, stream such a wide variety of things. You can see I've got very kind of family friendly PG movies in uh, Lady Driver and Roped that actually were really successful on Netflix. They trended. They were on the popular lists. Roped I think climbed as high as like twenty two on like most popular film on Netflix. Uh, and it's it's a very much uh, PG family friendly, and then you have the opposite end of the spectrum where you've got the you know uh, very gritty, dark you know the the Stranger Things and the and those kinds of shows that are extremely successful. So I think they really are open to a variety of of uh, genres and styles of filmmaking. So it's really hard to pinpoint you know what would work and what wouldn't work on there. Um, but obviously, check the specs. That's where I'd start, <laughs> and then make a good story, and uh, and uh, be as creative and get the best quality that you can. And are those specs available to the public on their website, or I think that so? Really? I, you okay. know, where I've read about it has has been more in like the um, like film gear, uh, like websites and, and publications like that. Um, I have seen like. Hey, this camera is actually, you know, meets the meets, you know, Netflix approved specs. I personally never have seen a sheet or whatever that says what those specs are, but um, and I've never searched it up, but I have read about it, like I said, in in uh, those, you know, like 4kshooter.com or something like that, you know, one of those uh, one of those websites. Uh, um, I've read about uh, the different cameras and if they meet the spec. Like this red Komodo that just came out, it got Netflix approved. So you can use this new red camera that's uh, it's kind of a much smaller red and it, uh, I believe it shoots 6K. Um, so it doesn't do the 8K that the newer reds or the other reds are doing now. Like we shot, uh, we filmed 
a California Christmas on a, a, a red Geminis that are 8K. Um, and uh, we, we shot uh, with some vintage lenses though. We had these vintage anamorphic cowas that we shot on on uh, on this 8K new camera. I, was, I actually really love trying to meld old and new. That's something that really kind of excites me, um, even to the point at uh, which I have been known to search, you know, eBay for some vintage style lenses that might not fit on my cameras, but I will figure out a way to adapt them. Um, even with metal files out in the garage, I'm shaving down, you know, mounting parts to make them fit together. And I love experimenting with that kind of stuff. Uh, so anytime I get that opportunity, I, I do it. This is the second film that I took really like vintage, uh, anamorphic style lenses and put them, match them with the, with the newer cameras. And uh, I love the results. I think it's, uh, just makes for really interesting imagery and, um, uh, and I just love anamorphic as well. If I had a choice, I would film everything on an anamorphic, just a quality to it that, that excites me. So you feel the older lenses are, are somehow lend to a better story? I'm, forgive me, I, I don't there, know too it's, much It's about like lenses. more character. Okay. So the lens, the lens itself, uh, the older lenses tend to have more character, which can be described in like, you know, maybe the, the edges blur a little bit differently or um, certainly lens flares are very different, uh, especially with anamorphic. Um, and there's some wonderful new anamorphic lenses. I've, I've actually filmed with them as well, and they looked beautiful. Um, but uh, I just happen to really love the characteristics, the way it bends light is slightly differently, uh, slightly different, or um, again, the way it pulls focus maybe to the center because the edges are maybe, the, the, the sharpness starts to dissipate towards the edges, which can, it, in one respect could be a little bit maybe scary for a filmmaker going, oh, I wanna make sure the shot's in focus. But if you understand that and know that going in, you know where the lens might be softer. And so you're not gonna frame it that way to where it would be an issue or you make sure you're paying attention. Like, oh, the top of their head's maybe getting a little too blurry. So you reframe a little bit to make sure they're in the sweet spot of the lens. A lot of the older lenses have sweet spots. So you gotta kinda understand and know that or else you could get yourself in trouble where the people are out of focus. But um, uh, but I just love the characteristics of it. And, and when you look at certainly the filmmakers that influenced me the most, they almost always have shot an anamorphic and some of those, that very same models that I've used from the Kawas and the Hawks and, uh, and uh, even some of the Ingenues, um, you know, some Spielbergs and the, and the uh, you know, uh, 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 Kubrick's and all that use those same same kind of uh, lenses. So um, uh, that was always kind of a dream of mine was to to be able to shoot on those someday. And then it's come to fruition on a couple projects. I've gotten to to use some of those vintage uh, uh, lenses, which was exciting for me because I'm kind of a camera nerd that way. I really geek out on all the different technology and I love new technology, but I also love the old stuff too. So again, that's where it comes back to me loving to figure out a way to marry the two together. Um, and uh, that's just always a, a kind of uh, exciting challenge to me. And if you buy those lenses on eBay, do you then later sell them again? Um, after Not the really, no, I kind of keep them. Okay. You know, I have some old Russian uh, lenses that just do some really cool uh, bokeh or bokeh, the way it uh, kind of almost a circular blur to them. Uh, those are really cool. I've used those. Actually, I used one of those on California Christmas for a scene. Um, uh, to me, they're always like they're tools that you can use for a certain situation. It might be really perfect for that moment. And, and uh, so I've got those. I've got, I just, I actually just adapted a, a 70s Ingenue zoom lens for tele, it was a television lens. And uh, it's a gorgeous lens. And I got it for like 150 bucks on eBay. And that lens probably when it came out was fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. But, uh, you couldn't really use it on a modern camera, especially the, the mounting wouldn't work. Um, and so what I discovered, I had to modify the mount on it 
in order to get it to work with another adapter that would then work on the, I have a Blackmagic uh, pocket camera. So to get it to even fit on there, I had to modify the, the rear mounting element on it, which I took it off the lens and kind of did everything I needed to do with it to make it fit. And then the other thing about those lenses and probably why you could get them, uh, I think other people are discovering this now because I've seen the price of them go up. They're You're giving like, away your secrets there, Sean. <laughs> yeah, they're now like $600-ish <laughs> in that range that I've been seeing. But the lens itself is a 8 millimeter to 112 millimeter zoom, which is a pretty decent zoom. But it's the size of, of the, uh, the back glass is too small for a modern camera, uh, like a, like a Blackmagic. Um, what happens when you put that lens on there, you have a, a crazy vignette. So you basically see the circle of the back element. So that you're only seeing that, and everything else is black, you know, and you've got this little circle. And that's the reason why most people wouldn't buy that lens, uh, and you can get them for the price that you can get them. But on certain versions of those lenses, they had built-in doublers. So basically there's a magnifier on the back end of the lens that you can flip. And what the purpose of it originally was for those lenses is it made them twice the focal length. So you could then, you know, on the just a flip of a switch, you could double your focal length. You could go from a 100 to a 200 millimeter zoom, and you know, there's all sorts of cool things you could do with that. Well, what I discovered is that you could take that same lens and put the doubler on it, and now it fills the full frame of my camera. So I don't have an eight to 112 millimeter, I actually have a 14 to 220 millimeter lens, which is still a great focal length for me to have on my camera. I mean, that's as wide as I'll ever need it, and that's almost as tight as I'll ever need it. And so that was the experiment of wanting to make that lens work and figure out how to adapt it to get it to work on my camera. And it worked. It's, it's really pretty incredible. Uh, and in fact, the Black Magic is there's a crop factor or like a, a on that so effectively what my camera is, is is I think it's a 22 millimeter to 400 and like 20 450 millimeter zoom and it looks beautiful I did a bunch of test footage with it and uh, again it has those old characteristics that I love it looks like you know you're shooting something in the 60s or 70s um, and uh, you know cost me 150 bucks so there you go um, and I will use it on a project, uh, I guarantee. Somewhere, somehow, I'll end up using that lens um, for something. So you keep them safely stored away? <laughs> yes, somewhere? yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I bring it with me on my project, so, um, yeah. So it was so interesting about that Ingenue is that it's a, it's a French-made lens, and the style of, a, of mount that it had was, I think it was called a B3, like a Bayonet 3. And... J Japanese lenses made it, uh, you know, American, all that stuff. They all had this B3 mount. Well, I was able to find online B3 adapters to Micro Four Thirds. So I went, great, here we go. I can, I can just buy this adapter and it'll work. No, it didn't work. There was a, a piece on that back element that, uh, on that back mount element on the Ingenue that was several millimeters deeper than it was on like the Canons of the same era or the other ones that that adapter would work on, did not work on mine. So I looked, I had to really like break it down, like what is stopping this adapter from mounting correctly? I figured out which pieces it was and then I'm like, okay, so how do I get this, this piece? Luckily it was aluminum, so it was fairly soft, that mounting piece. So I was able to take metal files, like I said, get it down to the right level which actually took a long time, longer than I was expecting. And then I went with, you know, some finer uh, sanding materials and, and got it to be smooth. And then I like, you know, uh, finished it so that it was, wouldn't affect the adapter at all. And then it worked, mounted on there. And, and I didn't know if that would change your rear focus element. I, I was a little bit worried that maybe that would affect it to where this adapter is made for a certain thing and your back glass needs to be a certain distance from your sensor in order for it to work. So I wasn't sure by filing this piece down if I would, it was a risk. I was like, I could be possibly ruining this, uh, this mount for my lens and it might, not, it might not work because it'll just be a few millimeters different. 
But luckily, it actually worked right out of the gate. As soon as I mounted it, I was able to focus all the way through. And those old, the other cool thing about those old lenses is they have a back element adjuster. So it's basically a, like a screw, a nut that you undo and you can then move and it moves the distance from that back glass. So you can really dial it in. You can dial them in to, to be, um, I'm trying to remember the term, but it's basically at your widest focal distance, you're in focus. And when you zoom in through the whole thing, you're in focus. And only certain lenses can do that. And, it's, and new lenses, don't. a lot of them don't do that. Or they're like $60,000, like I said, that lens will do this. But your $2,000 Canon can't do that. You know what I mean? So having this lens that has that ability is pretty darn cool. Um, and I was able to dial that all in. I was, I was, I was actually really surprised that one worked, <laughs> to be honest. But um, I then bought two more of that style lenses to try and experiment. One I failed. One I can't get it to adapt correctly. Uh, but the other one I was, it was a Canon. Uh, uh, one was a Fujinon. I couldn't get the Fujinon to work right. Um, but the Canon I was able to to get to work. Um, and I just used that one on a commercial shoot not that long ago and it worked great. And again, that was a similar focal length. So right now it's like a 28 to, to 480 millimeter zoom. If you want to know, those are old ENG lenses. Okay. So those are old like, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, really like 70s is probably where most of these are from. Um, but they're ENG lenses. Uh, so like, um, like Beretta and shows like that, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, you can probably find the most of them are, are like Fujinon and Canon, like on eBay and stuff. And they're, um, the, I'm trying to think if it's there, the two thirds inch ENG lenses is what I'm talking about. And they need to have that built in doubler. So it's like a two times focal length piece on it. And they, they look really funky. They come off the back of the lens. That's how you can usually tell they're on there. But in the description, always I, you know make sure you get one. Because if you get one that doesn't have that doubler and you try and put it on a modern camera, most of them, um, it will, uh, again, like I said, you'll just have that big vignette uh, where you know it's not really usable. Um, but once you have that, the doubler that's built in onto them that, you know, you can never use it really without it on. So you just have to live with this is my new focal length is is the double of this lens. You know what I mean? So because you said it gets too close to the sensor. It's not that it gets oh. too close to the sensor. It's just that the back element is too small to cover the full width of your sensor. So but what happens is when that with those built in doublers is it's a piece of glass that basically um, if this is the back of the lens, if this is your piece of glass, this this magnifier comes on top of it and it is bigger than that piece and that magnifica magnification uh, it creates the image to be big enough to cover your your whole lens or your whole I'm sorry sensor so you don't you no longer have those vignette on your on your thing so um, yeah it's pretty cool pretty cool little little uh, trick I'm not the only one who's discovered it either there's there's other people uh, who have who have experimented with it but definitely, um, it's not like a common thing, but uh, I always love that stuff. Like I said, I've taken old uh, still camera lenses. I've got some Zeiss lenses from the, from the 50s and 60s that I've adapted um, from uh, exact amounts, uh, which is a really interesting mount. Um, luckily, I was able to find some people that have made pieces to, to, that can adapt that to like Canon mount. Um, and, uh, and then I take the Canon mount and adapt that to the micro four thirds or, you know, whatever the, the different challenges are, uh, or different camera that we might be putting it on. Um, but I've gotten some great, uh, those, the, the old Zeisses are usually at least a couple hundred uh, dollars. But <clears throat> to me, if you can find a clean one that doesn't have, uh, you know, a bunch of scratches on the lens or a bunch of fungus on the lens, um, uh, they're still, they're really great pieces of glass. Um, I have a 25 millimeter Zeiss, um, uh, Carl Zeiss lens from the fifties. That's incredible. It's like tack sharp still today. And it just really, really nice piece of glass, uh, that I got for a couple hundred dollars where anything modern would cost you several thousand at least for that same focal length and, and, uh, quality. How do you protect it from fungus? Do you keep it away from moisture? 
Yeah, the, you know, the funny thing about fungus is that it actually, uh, it's hard to, to, you know, say why some lenses get it and some don't, but it is probably, it has to do with moisture and, and how sealed they are. Um, most of the time though, fungus really won't affect your image too much. It affects how light comes in to the lens and will like bend uh, like, like uh, kind of the flares. So sometimes even a little fungus is kind of cool on an old lens in my opinion. Uh, now if it's right in the dead center of your lens, maybe that then becomes annoying. But if it's just around the edges, again, it could give you some of those qualities that I actually even like. Um, so I won't necessarily turn down a lens <laughs> on eBay if it's got a little fungus on it. It just depends on where it is. Um, but things like scratches and things that really will kind of affect the image, then obviously you got to stay away from that. But uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on what project you're doing. If you need something super clean and you want it to look, you know, tack sharp like that, then those lenses won't be for you. But if you're trying to do something that has a little bit more of that style to it, then uh, I say go for it and experiment with it and, and see what you can do because, uh, you know, to me, that's that's what will set your project apart, make it make it feel a little different, you know. How would you know if a lens has fungus on it if you're seeing it on some site that's a selling? Well, I always ask those questions, and oh, most awesome. people uh, that I've discovered they will they'll list what's wrong with the lens and stuff like that. Um, so most of them will say, no, you know, clean glass, no scratches, fungus free. They'll say something like that. Or they'll talk about the blades. The blades aren't, aren't oily because a lot of times the lenses, if the like they'll have like a a leak and the the it'll affect how the uh, shutter uh, and the aperture works. Not the shutter, but the the aperture itself. So they'll list like what's you know you know you just have to read the details, then ask questions if you you know. And I'll ask that a lot of times. I'll ask you know you know. Is it does it have this or does it have that to, to clarify and again like I said sometimes I might be okay with it I'm like oh is there fungus is it like all over the the lens or is it like just on the edges you know and uh, and uh, I might still buy it if it has it if it if that's what I'm going for you know in that moment and if the price is right you know John I'm hoping we can go to page one of your script for a California Christmas and I'm curious what you like about the opening scene of the movie, which is page one, of course. Yeah, so uh, the opening is obviously, it's meant to establish uh, Joseph's character, played by uh, Josh Swickard. And he's kind of living this playboy lifestyle, big city, uh, wealthy. Um, obviously, he's got uh, uh, someone in bed. And, uh, you know, he's young and he's kind of using his... his uh, obviously his status to uh, kind of live carefree in that way. So basically the point of it is to set up his character and, and uh, for his arc throughout the story because obviously he needs to grow. Um, he's not the best of guys at this point. Um, and so it's really, I think it's, it helps illustrate that point. It sets up who he is and the journey he's going to have to go on, whether he likes it or not, is basically is is the idea. Obviously, you won't know all of that while seeing this first scene, but it sets it up of who he is and where he is at at this point in his life. And he's not a total jerk. He offers to buy the woman uh, room service. <laughs> yeah. So you got to give him some props. But yeah. so yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He, he... I, again, I think <laughs> those little details is that we we don't want people to just completely hate him right sure. off the bat, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and we did have some other things early in early versions and stuff that were like, yeah, that might make him too much of a jerk, you know. Uh, certainly, there's an argument there that he's still a jerk, but you know what I'm saying. Like, he has to have some underlying uh, qualities and redeemable uh, pieces that that uh, you want to see him go on a journey of growth and uh, self-growth and, and uh, becoming uh, hopefully a better person. So before we meet Joseph, the main character, we have this aerial shot. Can we talk about the establishing image? Yes, yeah, so the very first shot is kind of coming up off the off the water and, and revealing San Francisco, which is, uh, you know, that's where he is and where his family business is. Um, so kind of just establishing that whole that Bay Area and the big city and the and the the hustle and bustle of city life because it is a uh, obviously stark contrast to the ranch. Uh, that he later goes to and ends up spending a lot of time. Um, 
and we also did some interesting things in color there. So the city life has, has a little bit cooler of tones to them. And when we go to the ranch, uh, everything becomes a little bit warmer and, and uh, earthier uh, in the tones. So that's like a little, you know, kind of little details that we pay attention to when we're making it. Probably most people will never notice it, but uh, even with that opening shot, we wanted to, the color palette of it to be feel cooler in, in tone. Uh, versus the later part of the movie. And also, too, he leaves kind of like one woman in a hotel room, and then as he leaves, he kind of flirts with a desk clerk or yeah, something, yes, and yeah. you see her sort of fall, not not unprofessionally, but you, so it already sets him up to be sort of this Casanova type. Correct, yes, like, yeah. He's okay. definitely got that air about him, and, and uh, you get the sense that, uh, you know... <laughs> He doesn't hear no a lot. He doesn't hear no a lot. It's that hashtag best life thing, right? <laughs> He's living his best life, but, you know, anyways. Obviously, there's more to it than that, and and at his core, he's he's uh, searching for more. Sure, sure. Um, what do you think the hook is of the first page that makes people want to keep reading? It goes beyond just the first page, I guess, but the hook of the first page is 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 really the the kind of setting and the character like for me when i read it i wanted to know more about him you know so it's really like why is he this way like what what makes him uh and especially kind of because he's kind of outright just turns the girl down for a second date like right there it makes you go wow that's audacious like what like what is his story so sure. hopefully that's the hook that was for me when I read it uh, because uh, I didn't write this. Lauren Swicker did, and, and when I was sent it, uh, it, 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 that's what grabbed me right away. And I think he says kind of like, I'll call you or whatever. And, she's <laughs> and like, she says, no, no you, you won't. won't. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that little piece right there, I'm like, okay. <laughs> she's, yeah. and, and the fact that he can get away with that. I think there's probably plenty of people who go, well, I wouldn't be able to get away with that or, you know, <laughs> you know those kinds of things. Uh, uh, it makes it intriguing, and, and, and of course... The, you see the, the relationship walking through the hotel lobby. The people like him, you know, sure. and mm -hmm. he's he's got that thing about him. His charm, his charisma, um, uh, always makes it more interesting. And I think even in the back of the, my head, I was even initially, you know, even right away thinking, oh, he's going to have some lessons to learn. You know what I mean? Like there's there, <laughs> he's probably going to have to go on a journey, you know. And sorry, he's brought in to be, and I hope this isn't a spoiler, to be like no, a honeypot, no, yeah. to kind of like infiltrate and and seduce someone that he needs a signature from. So basically, his his company and his mother, who runs the company, they haven't been able to get this uh, the owners of this ranch to sell, which they need to build a shipping facility uh, for their corporation, uh, their their business. And so, his mom decides that. Her son basically doesn't really do anything. You know, he's got a title and works at the company, but what does he actually do? So she recognized he has a certain skill, and and it is a younger woman who owns the ranch. And so she says, let's put your actual skills to use. Go out there and get this girl to sell. You know, get this woman, young woman to sell. And so I think he thinks he's going to be able to waltz in there and, and get his way. And, and get the, the, the yes that he always hears. Um, and uh, and uh, I can say it doesn't go as, as he had planned. Sure, sure. So, and his arc evolves yes. from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's some case of missing, missing identity uh, as well, uh, or misidentity that, that not missing, um, uh, misidentity that, that happens for him as well in there. Um, that kind of starts him down a totally different journey that, that he thought he was going to be going on. So looking back on it now, what mistakes do you think were there in the first page, or was this the sh actual shooting script and there were no mistakes? Oh, this uh, well, this, yeah, this is definitely not the, the first version of the script, for sure. So this is, this is a, uh, closer to the shooting. I can't remember if what I sent you is the actual shooting, shooting one. And gosh, it's hard to remember if, if there was... I think there there was more time taken in in earlier drafts, which I think it took too long to get to those pieces, and, it, and it's, of course not even just the first page, but but that was part of it. So I think it got more refined and kind of picked the moments that actually mattered to to convey the the message that we we're trying to convey. Is this still the opening of the movie? 
And yes, this is still the opening of the movie. Right. So yeah, it, uh, it it stayed. And obviously, I think it's important again because we have to establish our our character's journey. You know, his character. So Joseph and also Callie, they both have their journeys, um, and they kind of, you know, their journeys intersect, and that's what they they help each other on their journey. So that's kind of the that's the you know. Uh, age-old kind of love twist there. Their, their, uh, their journeys intersect, and, and of course they need each other to, to kind of uh, complete their journey. The film American Fighter, you're the co-writer, Sean, is that right? Yes, I co-wrote it and directed it. Oh, great, okay. And it has martial arts elements to it? Yep, oh yeah, yep. There's martial arts, so definitely drew from some of that experience. And it's interesting because it takes place in 1981, so it's kind of pre-MMA and that whole thing. Uh, so it deals with kind of illegal underground fighting. Um, so there's certainly martial arts involved, but there's also this kind of street fighting, brawling thing that happens as well, and and uh, and wrestling. And so it, it integrates a lot of different uh, uh, fighting styles. If we take a look at the first page for the screenplay that you co-wrote, American Fighter, our protagonist is Reza, and you see kind of his life it's, it seems like it jumps back to different parts. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the main character, actually Ali, he, the opening of the film, which, which I felt was, was important, was to kind of <clears throat> tell this story, kind of jumping back and forth, and it opens with him in kind of the fight of his life. The movie starts with this, you see some images, some flashes, some pieces of this fight, and where he's kind of gonna be at the lowest point as well. And then we take a step back, and the film is then going to lead up to that moment again. Um, and I, the reason for that was it wasn't originally written that way. This was a you know the later and then to the shooting draft. We decided that it was important to have show that element right away. Number one to kind of it's that big impactful start, like get audiences interested and curious like wait a minute why is this happening why are these two people fighting and there's a huge crowd around them and and uh, you know what is it all about and we see our hero fall right like right in this the end of this beginning fight he gets almost knocked unconscious and so we go from there to him waking up in his college dorm room and uh, that's you know several weeks earlier or months earlier He's worried about his, his family is supposed to be flying because he's from Iran and he's worried about, and this is 1981, so the setting is the Iraq-Iran war uh, had just started and it was a terrible time in, in that area and just like two years earlier was the Iran uh, hostage crisis that happened and so in America at that time, uh, it was not a great time to be Iranian. Um, and so he had to face those kinds of issues. But so he wakes up in this college dorm room. Uh, he's got a roommate who is a good friend, and but he's really afraid for his parents. He wants them to make it over from Iran safely to the U.S. And so, uh, and his roommate's trying to assure him that he's going to be fine. And uh, <laughs> they've got wrestling practice. And so the idea, the concept is he is there for like a wrestling scholarship, um, and that's part of what helped get him out of Iran. Uh, uh, Iran, I should say, not Iran, but Iran uh, helped get him out of Iran uh, because of his wrestling prowess. Um, and so uh, he's now trying to help his parents get over um, because his mom is sick. She has cancer. And so he's trying to get her to some, to some more Western medicine. Um, and that's kind of what jumps off the, the story. So in the first page, if I remember correctly, there's is like a sort of these different flashes. So he's getting beat up. Then you see like a happy moment where he's running and saying, Mom, I'm coming to America. Look at the letter or something. There's a flash of the picture of the Ayatollah Khomeini. And mm -hmm. then there's the mother being hooked up to tubes. So all these like sort of things are coming at you. Yeah, that's when he gets uh, knocked unconscious. Um, he flashes back to his childhood when he was back in Iran. And uh, he's kind of flashing to the moment that he found out uh, that his mother, that something was wrong with his mom. 
So that's kind of uh, that's what's happening there. Um, he's not running excited that he's going to to America. What's happening is actually his father is telling him he's going to send him there because oh. he'll be safer. Oh, there. okay, sorry. So All he's right. going to go mm -hmm. live with his uncle mm. um, uh, in America, and he's actually disappointed. Like he's he's scared about this prospect of having to leave his family. Um, but they, you know, recognize that he has the opportunity there. He's obviously really good at wrestling, and that can that's what's creating this opportunity for him to get out um, of the really bad situation that was happening at that time. And so it's almost a nightmare of what he's experiencing, um, uh, and that leads him into waking up in his dorm room. Um, and so yes, he hears a new news broadcast. You know, he's he, that's. It's maybe a little bit different in the actual film versus what's on the page, but basically there's news broadcasts happening, talking about the events that are that are happening during that time, uh, and that kind of crosses with what his father is telling him about. I need to send you to America, and uh, and then him rushing to see his mother, um, and I always had this like kind of haunting image of following him kind of in a you know, uh, slower motion as he's making his way down this hallway to this door that's cracked open. And as he, as he pushes the door open, he sees his mother and she looks at him smiling. And as she tries to stand up to talk to him, she collapses. And that's the, the terror he's, he's uh, uh, having in that moment. And it's actually based on something that really happened to me. So that was that was a, a moment directly ripped from my own childhood, um, and uh, uh, my mother is still here. So I'll preface it that way. But she had an aneurysm, so it wasn't cancer, but it was an aneurysm, and she collapsed in a very mm -hmm. similar way. And it was that terrifying, you know. Uh, and I had my own kind of fevered nightmares for years and years about it. Um, and so that's a little piece of me that made it into the the script there that's melded with other kind of uh, uh, memories from Ali as well, Ali Afshar, because he produced it, and this character is actually based on him. Now this story has some real elements, but other ones are, you know, we fabricated for, for, for the movie, but um, the character himself is based on Ali, and his, because he's also a wrestler and all of that stuff, and, and he did come over from Iran, and, uh, and, and all that, have some similar experiences there. So you really see the stakes are high. So it's not just he's being pulled from his homeland, leaving his family. There's government turmoil. His mother is sick. Yeah. So everything's kind of thrown in that first page. Yep. All yeah. stakes are like, you know what he's dealing with. Yep. Right there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Did page one, did it evolve? Did it change? Was it less definitely stakes did. at first? Yeah, it definitely evolved. And, and at first we didn't see that fight happening uh, and uh, it, right away. Um, it did always kind of start with that dream, so that was there uh, from the beginning. But yeah, it evolved. There was many, many different drafts of it, and we, we experimented with different ways to open it, um, and ultimately that's what we settled on, um, was kind of, yeah, throwing all the, all the, and I, there is a kind of a funny story to, as to why uh, we ended up going that direction, and within the movie, because the time it was, it was the summer, um, what was the school year after the summer that uh, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back came out? Um, and so within the script, that was all the rage at the time. Like Everybody was talking about, it, especially, obviously, the first Star Wars was such a huge success. And then this follow-up with Yoda and, every, and, the, and the controversial ending of Empire Strikes Back. Sorry, spoilers, but <laughs> Darth Vader is Luke's father. Um, that's like all anybody talked about at that time. And so we work that into the script. I'm a huge Star Wars nerd myself. I love Star Wars. And so a lot of that, my personality was coming out through the script in that way too. So we have Ali's roommate's character is really into Star Wars. And he can't believe that Ali has never seen Star Wars. So that is a running joke through the whole script. And he's doing Yoda impressions, very terribly, by the way, but um, doing them nonetheless. And and uh, so I thought that was a really fun thing to, to help uh, set the tone and time place that this movie was set. Um, but the other thing that I thought about was looking at great 
movies like that, like the original Star Wars, how does it open? It opens with such a bang. I mean, it's just right off the bat, action is happening, spaceships are flying overhead, lasers are going, you know, you just get all the, all the stakes are set right there. And so that influenced how the opening pages of our movie um, happened. It was like, obviously we don't have spaceships and all that fun stuff, but we want to throw it in your face right away, like start it with a bang and hopefully get the audience hooked right there, right from the first flash you see on screen. And be like, whoa, what's happening? Oh my gosh, it's a fight, you know? And oh, oh, look at this kick and this punch. And oh, he's, oh no, he's, he's down already, you know, is, is uh, directly kind of influenced from Star Wars uh, in like how the rebels immediately, their ship gets captured by the bad guys and all hope looks lost right away, you know? So, um, yeah. With American Fighter, are we establishing, I'm sorry, is it Reza? Is, it, is, he, is he the main character or is no, it no, Allie? No, 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 Allie. Oh, sorry. Yeah. For some reason, I thought yeah, it I may Reza. have sent you. I may have sent you oh, a, a, okay. a draft that had the wrong name. Like uh, okay. we no did problem. play with it not being uh, Allie at one point, uh, okay. so that's probably the draft you got. No uh, problem. Again, I, I was sure searching if, yeah. for those drafts and I couldn't find because again, it was a different computer three years ago. Oh yeah. <laughs> so no I problem. think I must have sent you the wrong one uh, on accident. In page one of American Fighter, are we establishing Allie's kind of personality, or we're just more seeing the stakes that he's against? I think, yeah, it's more about the stakes that he's against because in the first page we don't get to see maybe a ton of his personality. Um, but that does come out right kind of in, the, in the, the subsequent pages. You get to know him a little bit more. Um, and, uh, and it comes out in some of the playful banter with him and his roommate. And, and, uh, but the, the story does get very serious very quick for Ali. So unfortunately he doesn't get uh, uh, a lot of lighthearted time uh, in this in this particular film. Is this first page still the opening of the movie for American uh, Fighter? More or less, yeah. There was some tweaks that, that in some stylistic choices that we played with, but uh, it's not exactly, but yeah, there's a lot of it is still there. So what was the log line for American Fighter? Did you, oh or what, like if you were gonna do your elevator pitch, what was it sort of? Oh my gosh, it's been so long. Fight Club so meets long. wrestler meets. Yeah, it's, you know? it's, it's, it's uh, uh, it really is, it's like, got equal parts Rocky and, and Karate Kid. I mean, those are, those, it's got a lot of heart um, and, and, and blood sport. I don't know how many people know blood sport, but uh, it's, it's kind of an amalgamation of all those things. Um, but again, like I said, the, the heart and the, the reason why he fights is to try and save his mother. So that's kind of at the core of it. Um, uh, and uh, that kind of sets it apart from those movies in a, in a way. Um, but yeah, it's the, it's the journey uh, for this character, Ali, like, uh, how far is he willing to go for, for love, you know, for family? And it's, it's a love story about his, there is a love interest in it and played by the awesome Allison Page. She's amazing. But the, the core of the love story is actually for that for his, his mother, you know, and he's willing to do anything to help save her, um, and including fighting in underground, <laughs> bare knuckle brawls, putting his you know life at risk um, if it means he can uh, save her. Because it, the story is is actually very tragic. His father is killed um, uh, when they try and leave the country, and it has to deal with the with the the uh, the events that were going on at that time. So. How many drafts did you have of the script? Oh my gosh, lots, lots, probably too many to count. I, like official drafts, you know, we go through the different colors once we, we started pre-production, um, probably a good six or seven or something like that. Um, that's like from initial like break, maybe more like five. Um, but yeah, all in, at least a dozen. Yeah, at least, probably more. <laughs> 